Good afternoon, everybody. This is Steve Wilson from the State Water Survey. And um, today our webinar is entitled, What Environmental Health Professionals Need to Know About Wells. And again, I wanna mention the private well class, which um, provides this program, is funded through the Rural Community Assistance Partnership and US EPA. And um, we work with uh, RCAP hand in hand around the country on private well issues. And uh, we're at the University of Illinois at the State Water Survey. Um, Okay. Um, this is part of a national program, as I just mentioned. The materials do follow our private well class, but it's not the class. Um, I encourage everyone who hasn't taken the 10 lesson class uh, to sign up. Um, I'll go over that more um, in the middle of the presentation, but it's on privatewellclass.org. You can uh, sign up, it's 10 lessons. It's sent to you once a week via email and it's much more comprehensive than what we can go through today in our uh, two hours today, together. Um, there will be time at the end today for follow-up questions. Um, as you know, since you registered, you were given the opportunity to ask questions in advance. We'll go through 10 or 15 of those questions. We can't answer them all um, that are part of the slide deck. And then at the very end, um, we'll take additional questions. So if you have questions, uh, Katie uh, Buckley, uh, who works? Who is a colleague here and works on this program with me? Um, we'll be monitoring the chat and the question uh, boxes on your GoToWebinar window. And if you have a question that comes up during the presentation today, you can ask it there. Um, she'll make a list of those and we'll pull them up at the end. Uh, and we'll answer questions until um, everyone's happy, I guess. So um, these webinars are worth credit, CE credit for environmental health professionals. And uh, we work with NEHA, the National Environmental Health Association to provide those. So we're a CE provider. Um, this webinar, if you attend it live and only if you're here today um, is uh, worth two CEs, uh, two hours of credit. And uh, we're also an Illinois LEHP provider. Um, and so if you're um, in Illinois, you can also get credit that way. Uh, there's handouts in your GoToWebinar window um, that you can download. Um, and for NEHA, there's forms. Uh, you send those back to us at info.privatewellclass.org and we'll finish filling them out. Uh, one thing to note, uh, NEHA has a two-year credentialing cycle. And so um, these are the times below in the bottom right that we've offered the same material um, in the last two years. And so, for instance, if you just started your credentialing cycle on 9-1-22, um, then you take this today, it really isn't to be used for credit until after 9-1-24, uh, when we off may offer it again after uh, that date. Um, I mentioned RCAP, the Rural Community Assistance Partnership. There's someone you should know as an EHP. Um, they're made up of six regional nonprofits. Uh, the, this is the list of who they are. We're in Illinois, so the Great Lakes Community Action Partnership is uh, the local RCAP uh, region for us, and we work with their staff. Um, the cool thing about our program is we deliver the online portion, or most of it, and RCAP has staff um, all over the country in every state who work on the uh, in-person do the assessments, uh, mention the well assessments when we get into this, um, but they're also uh, a great partner for putting on a workshop for well owners in your local area. Uh, they can provide speakers, they can actually organize a workshop um, on your behalf. Um, they're glad to work with uh, any, um, especially health department or um, group that's working with well owners to provide more education and outreach. And so if you need to get a hold of any of those folks, um, you can reach out to us and I can uh, send an email and introduce you to the person for that region, um, or you can call them or contact them through their websites, which are listed here. Um, just even the well assessments, it's an individual assessment. It's several hours of someone's time working with a well owner uh, to look at all the possible vulnerabilities that might be there. Um, it's really a useful tool and it's something that if you're not familiar with it, you should get familiar with it. So we're at the State Water Survey. I always like to talk a little bit about my um, where I work because um, it's a unique place. 
and uh, we do a lot of really good stuff. That's the best way to put it, I guess. So the water survey started in 1895 because of cholera and typhoid outbreaks. And so the state legislature in Illinois formed the water survey as a sister agency to our state geological survey to look at water quality in Illinois and identify issues related to cholera and typhoid. And so um, we have records going back all the way to 1895. There's just some really cool stuff here. This is an old glass plate slide um, from 1913. They're investigating a typhoid outbreak in Rockford, Illinois. And uh, in this, on this graph, it's a broken glass plate. Again, these are really old, um, over 100 years old. Um, there were 112 cases by September 10th. Only eight of them were part of this dairy route. Um, but they're investigating that because we'd seen in other places where it was contaminated milk that was causing typhoid outbreaks in some areas. So it's really cool the way um, all this is in our records and you can read uh, the history in Rockford's files um, all about how when this happened, as well as every well they've ever drilled, uh, their water quality analysis for the city of Rockford uh, up through today. And uh, we house the state's well logs. And so it's a, you know, it's an opportunity. What I do in Illinois is work with well owners and communities uh, on their groundwater issues. And so um, we have a lot of good information to provide in, in a long history. And, uh, you know, we used to do sampling. This is a pretty old slide where we sampled these community uh, hand pump wells that were in parks. And you can see the old tin cups sitting there uh, in the grass. And, you know, it was nothing to um, just go up and get a drink out of that, not worrying about all the biofilms that are in that pipe and on that, uh, in that pump. Um, and all the things we didn't understand, you know, way back when, so to speak. Uh, this is a well log. So in Illinois, during uh, right at the end of the Depression, uh, the Conservation Corps that was formed to get people back to work, every state used those folks in different ways. In Indiana, they put in uh, new parks. Illinois hired folks to inventory private wells. And so this is a, a well log that was typed up in 1934. Um, and I point out it's a 135 foot hand dug well. If you're familiar with large diameter hand dug wells, I grew up on one that's only 14 feet deep. Um, I can't imagine digging a hole in the ground three or four foot in diameter, 135 feet deep. Um, I'd be scared to death. Um, their pump is two buckets in a chain. And uh, it's a really, you know, it's a unique log just from the standpoint of how deep it is. But it was, the date was March 9th, 1934 when the person went to this home and, and dealt with them um, and their well was over 60 years old then so it had been hand dug in the 1870s uh, so it's a lot of cool history um, they had a pump their water stands at 60 feet they chose uh, a chain with a bucket on each end as a better way to get their water um, and there's tons of unique stories like this and uh, well logs in our files we house about 500,000 well logs and that's probably about half of the well logs uh, that there should be. Um, there's about 750,000 to 800,000 private wells in use just in Illinois alone and 23 million in the country. So today um, it's Katie and I, um, as it is most webinars, I'm a groundwater hydrologist here at the survey and Katie is a water resources outreach specialist. And um, again, she's going to take your questions and I'm going to do the presentation today. Um, we did receive a lot of questions. We obviously can't answer them all and some are repetitive. Um, what I encourage you to do related to the questions is for every webinar, we record the entire thing and put it up on our YouTube page. Um, if you, even this same presentation, the last time it was done was in February, the questions are different at the end because you all asked different questions than the folks that were on the one in February. It's worth it to go back to those videos and scroll to where the questions start. You'll learn a lot more about wells and issues um, just by going through the questions from all of the past webinars. We try to uh, highlight things that are different uh, that we haven't answered before, although in some cases we get questions um, every month that are the same question, and we understand that there's uh, new folks on every month on our webinars, as well as it's a, it's a more important topic and um, more central to issues that well owners have. So today we're going to talk about the challenges and issues we face, as professionals working with well owners. And again, this webinar is targeted to environmental health professionals. Um, what we know about well owners and their attitudes, why it's so difficult, why haven't two thirds of well owners tested their wells? You know, there's a lot of reasons. 
um, grab a little bit about groundwater and wells just as a background. And um, then I want to talk about the gap between groundwater and health professionals because it's quite a gap in some cases, and it has been in the past. And I think we're doing a lot of progress there to change that and realizing that we work together better as a team. Um, and so, yeah, I want to at least touch on some of the issues that I've seen um, over my past 30 some years here. And uh, then we'll talk about the private well class program as well as uh, answer the questions uh, we received from folks in advance. So really, you know, there's a lot of issues, um, but it comes down to these three. It's really about public health protection, uh, first and foremost, and then as well as source water protection and maintaining water quality. You know, an old abandoned well that someone pours something into because it seems like a nice hole in the ground where things can disappear uh, could affect many other wells if they contaminate an aquifer. And we see that a lot with uh, you know, Superfund sites and landfills where they're concentrating waste and if it leaks or um, it wasn't properly constructed, you know, we see uh, a plume that affects an entire aquifer and uh, entire communities may have to go off of uh, their groundwater supply. So it's an important thing even at the private well scale um, to understand those issues. And there's always going to be issues in the news. You know, today it's PFAS. Five or six years ago, it was lead. Um, you know, in the early 2000s, it was arsenic, flooding, drought, all those things. Uh, you know, I mentioned boil orders here because we have um, community water operators who will tell us that when they issue a boil order, which is done because of a break in a pipe in their distribution system, um, and they put that in a paper or on the radio, Sometimes they'll have private well owners call them and ask if their well is at risk. And, you know, I bring that up because it indicates that, you know, the folks that would ask that question don't really understand where their well water comes from or how it might or might not be related to a community water supply. And so it's important uh, to use any of those instances, like when there's a flood um, or whenever, a, you know, even a new livestock facility goes in that everyone's up in arms about to use those as, uh, a teachable moment for the well owners that you serve. Um, so the challenges we have really are based on, you know, community water supplies all have to meet the requirements of the Safe Drinking Water Act, which is a national standard, you know, the um, primary drinking water contaminants like the arsenic rule, it's 10 parts per billion. Um, a state has the, op has the option of creating a more strict rule in their state some have, I think California, the uh, arsenic standard is five as an example, but there's a set of standards that everyone has to follow. You have to have a licensed operator. You have to test regularly for a whole list of contaminants. Um, none of that is in place nationally related to private wells. Even the definition of a private well in some states is a little bit different um, because of the way the state legislature or the folks that make the rules have decided to write the statute. Um, we have two states where there are no well construction codes still, um, Pennsylvania and Alaska, although they're working on it. Um, and then because it's up to each state, every state uh, agency that's dealing with private wells, some have more resources and some have less resources. And so we see a lot of disparity in how they're able to enforce the rules they have, um, all those sorts of things. And in some parts of the country, um, you even have local jurisdictions that have authority instead of the state. And that really creates, uh, even in the same state, you may cross the street from one jurisdiction to the next and the rules are completely different on what you can do with a well or when it needs to be tested, um, all those sorts of things. And uh, we've learned when we started this program that you know a lot of county health departments, there wasn't a lot of training out there for private wells. And if you're not in a state where they're actually sampling every well that's installed or enforcing any kind of rules, um, then a lot of times the local or county health uh, staff haven't been trained properly on even what to look for with a private well. I mentioned New Jersey and Pennsylvania. I already said Pennsylvania is a state that doesn't have well construction code and it doesn't have a program for continuing education or licensing drillers based on passing an exam or a test. Um, anyone, you, me included, can send in our 60 or $75 to the state of Pennsylvania and get a driller's license. Um, it does not mean that you um, have any expertise in drilling. 
Um, on the other side, we have New Jersey, which over 20 years ago passed a law that requires the state to collect a water sample for any property that changes hands. So anytime a home is sold with a well, um, the state lab comes out and collects a sample. They only share the results with the buyer and the seller. How it's remediated is up to them. But because of that, they collect over 13,000 samples a year in New Jersey and have for over 20 years. And so they really have a database um, of, especially for natural occurring contaminants like arsenic or radium, they know exactly where those areas are, um, where there's risk, all that sort of thing. And so, um, but what all this has led to is the bottom bullet here is a very unorganized local approach to support well owners uh, in most parts of the country. And, you know, especially like at the county or local health department level, you may have a staff person who is really into private well issues, has maybe even written a grant to CDC to do some work and build a database or do whatever. But when that person leaves or moves on to a different position, their private well program basically stops because it's not sustainable that way. It's not part of the core of the department. It's just you've had one person who was champion, championing that issue. And uh, I'm sure you've seen it with other things as well besides private wells. Um, I wanted to mention Pennsylvania. I had someone question me about, I, I said in one of our webinars that, um, you know, Pennsylvania doesn't license drillers. And uh, someone emailed me and said, yes, we do. And um, this is what it says on the state's website. A license does not imply that a driller has knowledge of proper drilling or well construction practice. There's no statewide construction or siting standards, um, although some municipalities do have those standards. Ultimately, across the state, protection and maintenance of, private, of a private well is a responsibility of the homeowner. And that's so true, not only in Pennsylvania, but in most of the country. You know, even in Illinois, they take a water sample and we license our drillers and you have to follow well construction code when you put in a well. But once that well's in place and it's all been um, properly tested and good to go, so to speak, from that point on, it's completely the well owner or the homeowner's responsibility. The state or the county don't really get involved unless um, the homeowner asks the county if they would help with some issue or, or whatever. But they have no legal authority to condemn a well or to uh, force, stop, uh, force anyone to stop drinking the water, even if it's contaminated. And that's the case in most of the country. Um, there's a few local jurisdictions that may have created some rules for themselves to abandon wells or for someone to stop drinking their water, but that's less than 1% of uh, the United States. And so it's really important to understand that. Um, you know, one of the things for EHPs that's important is we have people tell us all the time, um, well, I don't wanna call my local health department because they'll tell me I can't use my water. Um, and I, I, I say, you know, if you're concerned about that, call them and ask them what, what legal jurisdiction they actually have because, you know, in 99% of the country, they don't have the authority to condemn your well or tell you you can't drink it. They may strongly recommend you don't if it's got a water quality issue, and that's what they should do because it's a health concern. But, you know, they're also there to help you, and so you should reach out to them if you can. And that's kind of the message we uh, try to put out there. So going back to all those issues that I listed, um, really it comes down to me to these two things. Poor well construction, you know, anytime in, in all the states that do have well construction code, those rules get amended from time to time as we learn more. And so over, you know, in Illinois, the law that first required uh, licensed well drillers and had a construction code was in 1968. Our code has been amended dozens of times since then um, as we've learned more about water quality and infiltration and what's a risk and all those sorts of things. But all of those wells that were already in place are grandfathered in. So when they change the well construction code, no one has to go back and, and remediate a well to bring it up to the new code. And so that's important because especially in rural areas, um, I work a lot in farming areas, you know, some of these wells are over 100 years old. And, you know, that's before there was any kind of construction code. Um, you don't have a log. You don't know how it was constructed. And yet that's their water supply. And so we see more often than not, it's poor construction that leads to uh, especially bacterial problems because they're not uh, sufficiently sealed near the surface. And then the other big issue is honestly the lack of well owner knowledge and education. Um, many well owners don't understand the responsibility they have, what kind of well they have, 
um, how deep their well is, anything about their well, what kind of geology they're in. They're in a very sandy area versus a very clay area. Um, you know, just have none of the knowledge they need um, to manage their well effectively and ensure they're protecting the health of their family. And that's where our class comes in as well. It's hopefully kind of a well owner 101 to get folks up to speed and understand what kind of well they have, why they need to know those things, where their pump's set, um, all that sort of stuff. <clears throat> the problem we have with that and the real challenge is that reaching well owners is difficult. Um, well owners come from every social, economic, and education class. They're in rural areas, they're in urban areas. Um, you know, I grew up on a well uh, and on a farm, and uh, but many people uh, moved to an area. We had a professor here at the U of I who was from New York City. He came here in finance, decided to buy this nice little colonial house out in the country, called us after living there almost a month uh, to ask about his well because he'd never been on well water and had no idea um, why he didn't have water one morning and uh, didn't never looked into it, never had, you know, and this is someone who's a pretty smart guy. And so you have all these kind of issues. Um, and the bottom bullet there, the very rural area, like where I grew up, there was maybe two wells in our square mile uh, section. Um, where in Cook County, which is Chicago proper and the most uh, closest to the lake, um, part of the Chicago metro area, um, you know, there's over 3,000 private wells in Cook County. And when I tell that to people, even from Illinois, they look at me like, there's no way, it's all urban. Well, there's a lot of areas that are unincorporated uh, between municipalities where they've um, just never been part of city services. And so they're all in private wells and septic. And so someone in Cook County that's in a completely urban area that's got a lot of industry and everything else has much different concerns about their well water quality than someone in a rural area that maybe is it's all livestock or crops. And so understanding all those things and how you reach those people is very different. Right. Um, and that's the challenge we have. So um, Barb um, Laconan from who was with the University of Michigan and Minnesota Extension who's retired. Um, and several other folks did this study where they sent out questionnaires to six counties, two in Minnesota, Wisconsin, and Michigan. And they were looking at social factors related to why people don't test. And so some of the highlights of that um, we've put here, you know, they put in a $2 bill and a free test and they had 72% return rate, just a $2 bill, 65%, and just a coupon, 48%. Kind of tells you, you know, um, she said that they actually had people returning the $2 bill saying that it was um, there. They felt like, you know, they shouldn't have to be paid to provide these results and blah, 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 blah. So you get all kinds of folks. Um, but for there was about 1,100, I believe, or so that had never tested their well of the 1,700 that completed the surveys. And of those folks uh, on the bottom left here, you know, 87% were only slightly worried or not worried at all about their well water quality. And that's not ever having tested. And so, you know, the message we have is you really don't know what groundwater and well water can be the best tasting, um, but you know, arsenic is colorless, odorless and tasteless. And so, and it's naturally occurring. It's just depends on where you live, whether you might have it or not. And so not understanding those things, um, it's important to test your water and that's the message we try to put out there. Um, they provided a laundry list of reasons why people don't test. And these are the top 10. There were more than this. But um, we've been drinking it for years, didn't know what to test for. And you can answer more than once um, all the things that, you know, that's why these numbers don't add up to 100. But, you know, I don't want to know. 8% people said they didn't want to know what their well water quality was. And you just wonder why, right? I mean, it's um, I liken it to how uh, some people refer um, wait as long as possible to go to the dentist or the doctor. They're afraid of what's going to happen and what it might cost if they if they do have an issue. And and so it's kind of a, just it's human nature in in some ways. So um, so for instance, why people don't test? Um, this one's on us, if you if you will. They don't know what to test for. Didn't know how to test. Didn't know uh, I should test. So that's about us doing outreach and education to the well owners we serve and making sure they understand why it's important that they do those things. Um, on the other side, um, 
you know, people just assume it's safe. They don't understand that there's actually a risk. It's probably fine. I really don't want to know. I've been drinking it for years. Um, and so there's a lot of different reasons. And we've actually developed some material based on this work that, work that we've done uh, that I'm going to sh- talk about next on how to do outreach to well owners to try to, you know, affect change and get them to at least test their water. Um, and there are a bunch of reasons why people don't test. It's not one or two things. It could be cost. It could be, hey, you know, and my dad used to say this, uh, no one's ever gotten sick from our well water. Well, that's probably one, not true. Um, but two, it's because you get used to the water in your well. It doesn't mean that someone else that drinks it isn't. Or if um, you're off that water for a while, um, you come back and start drinking it, it can make you sick. Um, cost, lack of understanding. And, and some people, especially rural folks, which I am one or I was one, um, just don't trust the government and they want their independence. And it's like, has it killed me yet? And that's it's that simple. Um, not understanding, you know, the message we try to provide, especially to folks in rural areas is what about your kids or your grandkids? Uh, what about people who come over? Um, they may not be used to your well water and, and it's a risk for them. Um, as far as aquifers and wells, we're going to jump to that. Um, there's really three types of wells. There's wells where there's no real aquifer. Uh, if you're in, there's a lot of areas where there just isn't a good bedrock or sand and gravel aquifer. And in those cases, a lot of times you'll put in a large diameter, three or four foot diameter, dug or bored well. Um, and the reason you make it so large is because it stores a volume of water. And it's usually using the water table, which is shallow, um, so water can seep in slowly. And I'll go over examples of these in a minute. The other uh, two types are either in a sand and gravel aquifer. Um, you have a sand and gravel well, it's got a screen at the bottom, or a drilled well into bedrock, um, consolidated rock. Typically, it only has a casing into the rock, and then it's an open hole. And I'll explain that in a minute. Um, you know, in some areas, especially in the northern part of the country where there's glaciation, you may have sand and gravel and bedrock aquifers that you could uh, drill a hole, depending on how deep you drill. You could hit one or two sand and gravel aquifers and then one or two bedrock aquifers. Um, in other cases, you may not have any. And it's important to understand um, how those type well types matter. You know, it turns out where I grew up in central Illinois, we had an old hand dug well, my grandpa. Uh, hand dug in 1933. It was only 14 feet deep. It was in a ravine so that water uh, came in from both sides basically. It was in a low spot and so we had a lot of infiltration. It was, uh, like I said, it was probably never safe, but it always had plenty of water. Um, If we would have uh, been able, if he'd have known and been able to drill a well uh, 75 feet, we would have hit a sand and gravel aquifer that would have been a lot safer. Um, But at the time, uh, that was a long time ago, and he didn't know it. So that's uh, where that is. So for board and dug wells, again, they're large diameter. You can see in this picture that right underneath those gentlemen's feet, there's a hole uh, in the ground. That's a, that bucket rig is uh, taking out a you know three or four foot section of dirt and basically drilling a hole that's that wide. And they'll put concrete tile uh, vertically in that. And where those meet up and and seat on each other, there's a male and female in, uh, water can seep in. And so um, in a typical area, you know, the water table, um, which is just where the ground is saturated, maybe between seven and 20 or 30 feet below land surface, that's not necessarily an aquifer. It's not sand and gravel, or it could be more fine material that um, water doesn't flow through very fast, but, water will seep in those wells. So the reason you have such a large volume is you use the water in the morning or at night, you lower the water level in your well, that lower water level causes water from the surrounding area to seep in and try to level out again, and it fills it back up overnight, and that's the process you use. And if you only had a normal drilled well that was you know, five or six inches in diameter, you would use the water up with one shower or less, and you wouldn't have water again until the next day. And that's the whole point. It's almost like a cistern. It's meant to store water when there's an opportunity to collect it, and then you use it, and it fills back up over time. Um, These are all examples of dug and bored wells. Um, The one on the upper left is an old hand dug well, and they've covered it with some two by tens and pieces of tin, 
and uh, some rocks and concrete blocks. Totally unsafe. You can see how it's kind of muddy over on the right side and how those posts look all worn. That's because it's a cattle pasture and the cattle come up there and use those as scratching posts. And they're also doing their business there and all that seeping down in the ground. And uh, it's an old brick lined well, so it's taking water can seep in from six inches below land surface. So anytime it rains and the water gets saturated, that well's filling up with material that's at the surface there. Um, the one on the right is the traditional board well that uses concrete tile. And so um, again, those pieces of concrete tile are usually four foot long. And so uh, if you assume that's about a foot above land surface, then three feet below there, is the first seam where water can seep in. Still not great. Um, they could have, um, it could be that the way they're designed today is you put fill, uh, clay fill around this well uh, through at least 10 or 15 feet so that there's less chance of surface infiltration getting in along the well. And the one on the lower left is really just like the one on the right, except the large part of the well doesn't start until 10 feet below land surface. And I'll show you that in a diagram next but it's, uh, it gives you a chance to put more clay type fill or concrete um, in the upper 10 feet so that there's less risk of surface infiltration into the well. And so here's those two wells, um, they're, they're flipped here. The one on the left is the picture that was on the right with the concrete pad at the top. And you can see they've got concrete um, down to 10 feet or so along the side so that water can't get in there. And all the water's coming in where those joints are uh, below that. And then the one on the, the right is, you know, the six inch casing and that goes down to a concrete pad uh, where it's seated and that allows you again to put clean earth fill or you could put concrete and that protects from surface infiltration getting into the well. Um, the problem with dug and bored wells is typically they're getting water from a shallow source. Um, even at 10 feet, that's um, not that far below land surface where if there was a large spill or um, a lot of rainfall and something uh, pooled or ponded that it would seep down through and maybe get into the well. And so what we've seen in some of the research we do related to uh, the vulnerability of wells, dug and board wells are usually the most vulnerable to surface influences. And so it's really important then to make sure that folks aren't doing anything near their well uh, that could uh, cause a contaminant to, to seep into the ground. So sand and gravel wells have a screen. This is a well screen. And you know the idea uh, is to let the water in and keep the sand out. It's no different than the screen on your door. It keeps the uh, bugs out and lets the air in. Um, these are usually uh, stainless steel woven. And the size of the slot that's between each of those strands of stainless steel is based on um, what you find in the field. So when you drill a well and you hit a sand and gravel aquifer, the driller will pull up, um, you know, samples of what kind of material it is. And if it's more coarse, uh, closer to gravel size, then those slots can be bigger. And if it's more fine, then those slots need to be smaller. And so usually um, dr a driller will carry a range of screen sizes based on the type of material they're gonna drill in. And we certainly see, um, some big differences depending on where you put your well screen in um, the size of the sand grains or the gravel. And typically it's like, you know, when in a glacial environment anyway, um, as the glaciers were melting and water was running and all the sand and gravel were being deposited, uh, the heaviest stuff falls out first. So if you have a sand and gravel aquifer that's 30 feet thick, usually the finest sands at the top and the coarsest stuff is at the bottom. And so a lot of times a driller will drill down to the bottom of that unit, hoping to get more coarse material because if you get real fine sand, no matter how small your screen slots are, um, it can start getting through and that's really hard on pumps and, um, and your, you'll have sand in your sink and everything else. And so, and that does happen. Um, so the important part about a sand and gravel well is water is only coming through the screen. So using a 200 foot well example, if you have a 200 foot well that's finished in sand and gravel, probably 195 to 196 feet of that well casing is a solid pipe, either PVC or steel. 
and the last four or five feet is a screen. So for anything to get in the well, as long as it's properly grouted around the outside of the annulus, uh, in the annulus uh, and the outside of the well casing, the only way for anything to get into that well is it has to travel from the surface down to 195 feet through whatever material, geologic material might be there. So it's pretty well protected in that respect from surface influences as long as it's properly constructed. So um, here's a well log um, from Illinois. And um, you know, there's a lot of information on here. These are really nice logs. Uh, but in the bottom right, it shows the geology. So there's two feet of topsoil, uh, 12 feet of clay, brown clay, and then gray clay. And the difference there is if it's gray, it means it's always saturated. Brown clay means it's been, has air, uh, has air has gotten to it. So we know the water table is around 14 feet in this area. Okay. And then we hit um, sand and gravel from 120 to 126. That's not very much sand. So they went on deeper and they hit a, um, more sand um, at 260. And you can see it says sand tight. That means it's finer sand. It's harder to drill through. Um, it's also not ideal. And then as they got deeper down to 290 to 295, you know, there's been 35 feet of sand total, but the stuff near the bottom has some gravel in it. And it's coarser. And so um, if you look back up to number 22, they used, uh, this is steel casing, I think, and um, there's a five foot stainless screen um, from 291 um, to 295. So that's actually a four foot screen. Um, and then slot size is 20. And you know, that's 0.02, I believe, um, hundreds uh, as far as the spacing. So it's got the location. It talks about um, when it was drilled, the pump capacity, this is on the left side, um, 15 gallon per minute pump. And then they also, um, number 23, they took a static water level measurement, was 159. So even though the sand doesn't start till 260, it's under pressure. And so it came up to 159 feet below land surface in the well. And then when they pumped it at 20 gallons a minute, it only dropped to 165. So they only had six feet of drawdown pumping 20 gallons a minute, which means there's a lot of water available there. And so they were able to put in a 15 gallon per minute pump which is bigger than most homes have. Usually they're five gallon per minute pumps. That's mostly all you need. So there might've been some livestock here or um, other, other uses for the well, because that's an um, unusually large pump for a, a home. But it's a, it gives you all the information you need. And um, what we tell well owners is, this is the most important piece of information you need to have. And if you're gonna drill a well, um, make sure that you have in your contract with your driller uh, to provide this log, this log or, you know, whatever that might be for you, that jurisdiction, um, but as much information as possible, um, because it all matters once you start having an issue. Um, if you have some kind of problem, uh, you know where your pump set, you know, in this case, um, I don't remember where the pump was set. I'm not seeing it right here. Anyway, um, but all that is on here. Oh, it's set at 186. So they felt like at 186 feet, they're never gonna have the water level drop uh, below the pump. And they have also got almost 100 feet that they could lower the pump if they needed to, if water levels drop for some reason. And so it's a, you know, it's a pretty good, uh, there's a lot of good information here is the bottom line. Um, and then they also provided, uh, they have software, the Kickapoo Drilling Company is, and our well records are public information in Illinois. And that's why, um, you know, he, you know, said who the name Mike Williams was the owner. Um, it's all public information. And so it's all shareable. It's all um, available to anyone who, if you're going to buy a home and you're in Illinois, you can come look up a log in advance. So you have more information. You can find out if we've ever done a water quality analysis on a well. All those sorts of things are available. And that's the kind of investigation we encourage well owners to do before they buy a property or um, as well as sample, obviously. But um, so this is a sand and gravel well, you know, showing the screen at the bottom with the, the horizontal lines. Um, so the difference with a bedrock well is typically you only have casing 10 to 20 feet into the rock. So it's called seeding the casing, uh, S-E-A-T-E-D. Um, and the point is when you're in bedrock, you know, sand has a porosity of about 30%. So if it's full of water, for every 100 feet of sand, 30 feet of that is actually water, 30% of it. 
Um, it's a space between the grains. Bedrock is solid rock with cracks and fissures. And um, the rock itself, um, although it could have a little secondary porosity, typically all the water is coming from the cracks and fissures in the rock and the connections between those. And so you have to have an open hole. Um, the rock itself acts as the casing. You know, you're drilling a hole through rock, you can, it doesn't go anywhere, it doesn't fall apart, it's solid. And then every fracture you hit then can contribute to the well uh, and go to the pump. And so that's what this diagram is showing. Um, you've got steel casing that goes 10 to 20 feet into the rock. Above the gray there, it says overburden, that's the sand, silt, and clay. Uh, there's a water table um, what we've already talked about. And so it depends on how many fractures you hit and how interconnected the fractures are, how much water might be available. We see bedrock wells that only pump a half a gallon a minute, and we see some that are used for irrigation and pump 1,500 gallons a minute uh, based on large fractures, the amount of water available and all that sort of stuff. The issue is it's almost like pipe flow though. So it depends on, if you only have one fracture for a bedrock well that's for this partic that particular well, um, that fracture may go back up to the surface. It could go to another fracture that does go back up to the surface. It's You're not as sure where your water's coming from and it could come be influenced over a larger distance. And the other issue is it depends on how deep the bedrock is. So if bedrock's near the surface, you may only have 30 or 40 feet of casing. So that same 200 foot well can let water in at 40 feet if the casing stops there. Um, I was in New York working with uh, some folks there, and we had a number of wells that were over 600 feet deep, and they only had 15 feet of casing. They were before some of the rules were in place. Most states now you can't put in less than 50 feet of casing, and that's to help protect from surface influence. But we found a number of really deep wells that had very little casing. And so what that means, uh, if it only has 15 feet of casing total, that means water can come in that well at 16 feet below land surface. So it's much more uh, probable or possible that surface uh, water influence could affect that well. And so it's good to know um, what the situation is uh, with any well owner you're working with, or if you're a well owner, um, having the log and understanding how much casing you have is a big deal with a bedrock well. Um, and there are some bedrock wells, especially in sandstone, that may be cased all the way down. Um, but that's not the norm. Uh, it, it does happen. Sometimes you see casing uh, that's perforated. Um, that goes much deeper. But um, in general, this is the way a well, a, a bedrock well is constructed. And here's an example, again, from Illinois, Camp Algonquin, which is up in the Chicago area. Um, and what's, uh, if you look at 15, the casing and liner, there's 179 feet of PVC pipe and then 20 feet of black steel. So when you look at the geology, the geology, they hit bedrock at 187 feet, broken limestone, and there's two feet of broken limestone and then solid limestone bedrock from 189 to 257. So if you look at the casing again, they put in 20 feet of steel between 179 and 199, so it's 10 feet into the bedrock, and then after that, there's no more casing. So they continued to drill down until they hit shale, uh, and they stopped at 260, because shale does not transmit any water. It's basically cemented clay. And so um, the water's coming from the limestone uh, and the fractures in the limestone, but it's all an open hole. There's no casing below 199. And what you can see from 17, which is the static water level, um, they pumped it at 25 gallons per minute for two hours. And the water level was at 130, which again is well above the top of the bedrock. Um, so it means it's under pressure, it's our, under artesian pressure. And then they pumped it uh, for two hours, it dropped to 160. And again, there's, you know, it's, there's a 260 foot hole there. And uh, so there's a lot of water available. Um, they put the pump at 160 because they only put in a pump that pumps 12 gallons per minute. Um, and that's a typical thing a driller will do is they'll pump it harder than they plan on putting the permanent pump um, so they can be sure that the well will make the amount of water they need. So they pumped it for two hours at twice the rate they're actually going to, uh, that's capable with the 12 gallon per minute pump. And they realized that, you know, they should never have an issue at 160. It should never reach uh, that deep. So, uh, yeah. Okay. So, um, again, I mentioned poor well construction. 
So what do you do? Um, you know, I, as well construction code changes, um, those existing wells don't have to meet code. They're just grandfathered in. Um, and then, you know, that's really the only way you could have done it. But because of that, we st still see wells and pits and many hand dug wells that are much older and those typically aren't safe. And so um, not only do they provide an opportunity for surface contamination getting in the well, but in some cases they can be a safety hazard. And here's some examples. I already showed you the picture on the bottom. Um, that well just, you know, there could be snakes in there, anything. Um, the Washington State Department of Ecology is the state agency in Washington State that regulates well construction and, and uh, well drillers. And they have a blog and they put this up, they have several things on their blog related to uh, wells. And in this case, you know, someone had a piece of plywood over their well, which is a large piece of corrugated pipe. Um, and it broke, she fell in and it killed her. And we see this a lot. But if you look at, this is the little well house, you can see the wall in the background and there's a funnel there probably for oil uh, for the pump. And it looks like gray insulation that's, you know, deteriorated and is laying all around that. Guarantee you some of that's fallen in the well before. It's uh, part of the well water that she has. Um, also, very likely there's mice fall in there, other things. Um, and that's not to mention the picture on the right of the dead goat uh, that fell in a well. And they put a, um, this is an old brick lined well or stone lined well that they took a piece of um, concrete tile or pipe and stuck it in uh, at the top, but it was only a foot above land surface. And so a goat came along, uh, it wasn't covered, um, knew there was water in there and uh, dove in or fell in. And that's what happens. Um, you know, we've, we've had folks even on our webinars uh, send us questions about uh, you know, my dad's well smelled funny. We went out and took a look and took the cover off and there's about 50 snakes in the bottom of it and all those sorts of things. And these are, that's water that people are drinking. And so it's really important. A well construction, as I mentioned, is a huge issue in understanding uh, that it's your drinking water supply. If, if, if something like a snake or a mouse can get in it, then, you know, that's likely it's going to happen. And so um, it needs to be sealed at the surface and properly taken care of so that can't happen. And so what should you do? Um, you know, help people understand to bring it up to code the best they can. Um, some cases it may mean they'd have to put in a new well and they're not willing to do that, but you can certainly provide a more safe, sturdy cover so that that doesn't happen. If it's a well in a pit, um, though that was done before the 60s, whenever they invented the pitless adapter, um, so that in a cold climate, you kept your well, you, you stopped the top of your well was three or four feet below land surface in a pit so that it wouldn't freeze. Um, but now you should extend that to the surface, fill that all in with clay. Um, yeah, and talk to your well authority, your county or local jurisdiction about what's the best approach to making my well safe. And, uh, and they will give you advice, I guarantee it. Uh, same thing for abandoned wells. Because well logs weren't required until the 60s, and in some states, much later than that. In New York, it was 2000. Um, there's more undocumented wells than those on file in some states. I know New York went through a large process where they use tax records to identify uh, properties that have a well, but they don't have any information about those wells. And I think it's estimated they only have about 15% of the well logs for the wells that, that are in use in New York State. Um, and that's because they didn't require that stuff to be filed until 2000. Um, but like wells, like well pits, um, abandoned wells are uh, a hazard. Some people see this big hole and think it's a great place to throw my trash. Uh, we see that a lot. And all you might be doing is contaminating an aquifer. If you have a well or you know someone who has an abandoned well on their property that's, or, you know, an unused well, encourage them to abandon it. Um, it can leave the well owner responsible if someone gets hurt or even if someone falls in it and gets killed, even if they're trespassing, um, it's going to come back on the owner. Um, and it's also could contaminate an aquifer depending on what type of well it is. And, uh, you know, people throw pesticide cans and you name it, we've seen it. Um, and so it's just, 
they shouldn't exist. And there's even cost share programs in some areas to help abandon wells. I know um, Iowa has a grants to counties program for that. And some of the soil water conservation districts um, may cost share having that done. But if you have an old well that's not in use, it's certainly worth not keeping. Um, these are just some more examples. Uh, some of these are newspaper clippings from the 90s um, where folks have fallen in an abandoned well and it killed them. And um, I don't know, those of you old enough to remember Jessica McClure, she was an 18-month-old who fell into a well in Texas. They covered it live on CNN. Um, it took 18 hours or 24 hours or something like that to get her out. And, um, yeah, it made national news because – you know, went through the night and she was singing and I, I remember all that. Now she's a mother of three. Um, they were able to get her out. And these two pictures are both also from the Washington State Department of Ecology uh, from their blog. And you know, the one on the upper here part is uh, a horse that got stuck in an old abandoned well. And the Sheldon man falls 45 feet into a well. They pulled him out and he walked away. Uh, it was in his backyard, had no idea it was there. Uh, very fortunate, which if you look at these newspaper clippings, uh, some of these folks weren't so fortunate. Um, and it, it's, they fell to their death. So um, it's a really big topic. There's probably as many abandoned wells, or there's probably many unused wells that we don't know about that should be abandoned properly and sealed um, as there are wells in use in many states. Uh, there's just a lot of old wells out there that are a risk. So as far as groundwater and health gaps, um, you know, the, the point I want to make is um, we all really need to work together. I'm a groundwater hydrologist. Um, you know, my training's in civil engineering. Um, I've done a lot with because of private wells on the health side. Um, but what we see is a lot of times the hydrologists and groundwater folks and geologists are working separately from the environmental health professionals and the clinicians and everybody else when really we really have a lot to share and help each other out. Uh, groundwater is complicated and uh, the example I'll share there is um, we had some folks from CDC want to do this large study in Illinois looking at uh, cancer based on private wells in, uh, in like a third of our state. Um, we showed them all the maps of some of those areas have two or three different aquifers all with different chemistry some have no aquifer, um, and there are probably 20 total different aquifers in that area. So you can't just look at uh, a cancer issue and their private wells and the water quality and assume you have to know which well they're on, if they're actually drinking the water, um, all those things. It's just not straightforward. Um, you know, there's a difference between a groundwater sample and a drinking water sample. We tell well owners they should collect both. And what that means is the water coming from your well, if, if your pump is on and it's um, pulling water out of the ground, um, if you run an outside spigot, for instance, or a hose outside where that doesn't go through any of the treatment in your home or through your pipes in your home, if you let that run um, to all the conditions stabilize, we use temperature, pH, and conductivity. Uh, to, to let stabilizes and we collect a sample and we know we're collecting a groundwater sample that's fresh from the ground, not been sitting in the well, not sitting in the pipes versus a drinking water sample, which is what folks are drinking in their kitchen tap that's set in their pipes overnight that's been through a filter or a softener or an RO unit or some other treatment device that changes the chemistry and they can be dramatically different. And so understanding what people are actually drinking um, all those sorts of things. Um, and we have no information on treatment or bottled water use, meaning if you want to look at an health issue related to private wells in a given area, you have to inventory every person and find out whether they actually drink the water. Do they have any kind of treatment? Um, or are they not using their well water at all and drinking bottled water? And that's information that none of us have. Um, we were asked one time by the New York Attorney General's office for a percentage of folks who have, uh, I can't remember what kind of treatment it was. And, you know, no one in New York has that information. Certainly we don't. But it's just there is no way to get all that information rather than door to door. Um, and so the point is, you know, we're all professionals and we can learn from each other. 
Um, if you have a team that's doing any kind of private well work, you really need to have both groups involved so that you have folks who understand the health side, you have folks that understand the geology and the groundwater side. And um, we still see in some cases groups that feel like they're the authority and they don't need any of these other disciplines involved. And, and I think that's short-sighted because I know I learn a lot and that's, I've said lagoon example here. We put a group of, of eight or 10 professionals from different walks of uh, the private well world, regulators, drillers, county health, um, hydrologists, um, all, a whole group of folks, and we developed this well assessment tool. Uh, and I'll show you that in a little bit. But when we got together and started talking about things, one of the things that came up was types of septic systems. And someone said, well, some people have lagoons. And I was, I had never heard of that, honestly. Um, I had no idea that in some states, Illinois being one, Oklahoma, Nebraska, uh, two others, you're allowed to have a lagoon for your wastewater in your home. Instead of having a septic tank or a septic field, you can pump it to a lagoon and that's uh, a legal septic system. And so, um, you know, I was floored by that, honestly. I, I'll never forget it. I just had no idea. You know, I, I would think with the smell and everything else that that wouldn't be an optimal solution. Um, but there are a few in Illinois and there's some in other states. And so you always have something to learn uh, from others. And that's uh, kind of the message that I wanted to bring out here. And here's an example. Um, I've spent a lot of my career working in the Muhammad Aquifer. It's an aquifer that sits on top of bedrock. It's under three sets of glaciation, uh, the pre-Illinoian, the Illinoian, and the uh, Wisconsinan glaciers. And so you have all this complicated geology as you go towards the surface because, uh, you know, glaciers advance and recede and then melt and deposit some sand. And you can see all the little areas with the little circles. Those are all sand units. In some places, there might be three or four. There's organic layers. We drill into this and we've hit uh, petrified wood. Um, you know, it was, it's, it was really cool. Um, but it's this huge aquifer in Illinois that extends through 11 counties and serves almost a million people in central Illinois. And if you don't spend a lot of time working on this, um, you know, there could be wells at in four or five different units here, and they all have different chemistry. And so unless you're ready to figure that out and understand which two samples are should be put together and which two are really from different units, you really can't make heads or tails over the water chemistry and the water quality and how that might affect health. And so um, I like this example, even though I'm not a geologist, I've learned a lot about glacial geology in my career um, because it really illustrates why we need each other. And if you're gonna work in an area that's over the Muhammad Aquifer, for instance, um, you might have wells that are not even in the Muhammad and you're trying to compare those samples that can't be done. Okay, so uh, the best thing to do then is develop a relationship with your scientific surveys and I'm talking to EHPs right now. Um, or your related groundwater resource agency, as well as extension. So that's the USGS, if you have an office in your state, uh, your state geological survey. In Illinois, we have a water survey. Uh, there's a couple other states that now have a combined geological and water survey as their title, but also groups like you know DNR in Wisconsin. DNR uh, is the primacy agency for community water supplies. They're also uh, regulate drillers and private wells. Uh, it, they go by a lot of names, DEQ, and, and uh, it was DEQ in um, Michigan. Now they've gone to EAGLE, E-A-G-L, -E I think. Um, DHHS is Nebraska. There's a lot of different names, or DPH. Um, in some states, it's one group. It's the Department of Public Health. That's the case in Minnesota. That's the case in New York. Um, but in other states, all those are separated into different agencies, um, but develop a relationship with whoever is working on those things. And especially, you know, not only the groundwater resource agency, if you will, but also the people that map aquifers or collect water quality data. You know, if you Google uh, groundwater quality of Michigan, you know, just as an example, I'm making that up, it, there should be links that show up for different state agencies that maybe do that work. And that's where you start. And, you know, to learn more about your area, um, on these four things, the geology, um, what are the typical aquifers, what's the actual water quality, 
I guarantee you there's some data available. You just have to know where to find it um, or start looking for it, and someone you reach out to will know where to find it. Uh, well construction and natural water quality, you know, the biggest issues we have are natural water quality, arsenic, radium, uranium, um, other things not necessarily the spills or uh, something near a landfill. Those are localized problems, but you have entire states that are high in arsenic, right? I mean, Maine is a good example. Um, and so understanding where those things are and what issues you might have locally are really important for you giving advice to a well owner. Okay, so I wanna talk a little about the private well class. Um, it's really the answer to what can I do to help private well owners understand their wells and water? Encourage them to go to this website, privatewellclass.org. There's a button to sign up. Um, and again, it's all free. It's all funded through RCAP and the US EPA. We're able to provide all the, this, like this webinar, those of you that are getting CEs today, uh, it's a free class. You don't have to pay for it. Um, and it's self-paced. So what it does is it sends you a lesson as a PDF once a week for 10 weeks. If you sign up at six o'clock on Friday night, every six o'clock on Friday night, you're gonna get the next lesson emailed to you. You're on your own to read it. Um, and you're on your own to, you know, if you have questions or whatever, the reason we actually even offer continuing education for environmental health professionals is because the first year we started this, um, there's an evaluation at the end. So after the 10th lesson, there's a quiz that um, is just to help us understand what you've learned. It's the same quiz you take in the beginning but in theory, you've learned something so you do better with your second score and that makes us look good because we've taught you something. Then there's an evaluation. And in that evaluation, 22% um, I think of the first uh, year's participants, which was not quite a thousand or maybe a little over a thousand people were environmental health professionals. And they all asked two things. One, why wasn't this available when I started my job? And two, how can I get credit for this? And so after that, we reached out to NEHA, developed a partnership with them, and now um, not only can um, you get CEs for participating in these webinars, but we actually have a version of our 10 lesson class on NEHA's e-learning page, which I'll show in a minute, um, that where you can get a credit for each one of the lessons. And so, um, yeah, you know, there's a lot here. We not only do the lessons um, and the webinars. Uh, so this is our front page. Let's go there first. Just click on take our free class. It takes you to a page where you just sign up with your email address, your first name, and where you live. And really the where you live is a state. Um, we've actually had people from 11 or 12 different countries who take our class. Um, there's been um, nearly 11,000 people who've taken the class now over the last six years or so. And uh, we ask that question so that we can show EPA that we're reaching folks nationally. Um, and that's really for for our own, um, you know, for reporting to EPA and showing that we're actually um, doing some good, if you will. We have a version that's in Spanish. So if you're in an area that has a lot of Spanish speaking folks, um, you can send them to this website. The, all the lessons are been, have been translated. Some of the videos have been translated. Um, yeah, and if you need more information on that, you can email us. And then, I mean, even the figures we've used and stuff have all been redone in Spanish. Uh, it's, uh, it's really a, a great tool. Um, for each lesson, there's a series of documents that are publicly available. Like for lesson one, it's called the Science of Groundwater. There's these other um, nine or 10 uh, documents that you can download. They're from other sources, but they're all related to the same topics. And the idea is if, the lesson didn't resonate with you for some reason, here's some more resources with more details on specific issues like aquifers or you know, groundwater basics or whatever it might be. And so there's one of these sets of materials for each of the 10 lessons. Um, you know, like for lesson two, the Michigan Flowing Well Handbook, you know, Michigan was losing 28 million gallons a day of groundwater to flowing wells where they just the pressure in the ground was high enough that when you put a well in this location, it would flow. The water level is higher in the well than ground surface. And so they passed a law and required those wells to be capped. And this flowing well handbook deals with everything related to flowing wells, including how to cap them and, and all that stuff. And um, it's a really useful book. 
if you're in an area. We have um, really one area in Illinois where we have a few flowing wells, um, and so it's really handy. Um, it's really well done, and it's things, resources like this that we put together um, and found information out on the web and made it available so that uh, you can learn more about, uh, our well owners can learn more about their wells. I mentioned NEHA. Um, if you go to their e-learning center, this is their login. Um, you can get to all the lessons um, and you can go through them. There's a quiz at the end of each one. Once you've uh, taken the quiz and passed it, you can get a, a one CE credit for each one. Um, if you are a NEHA member or if your state accepts NEHA credit, you don't have to be a member of NEHA. Anyone can register on their site and um, take these classes. That was part of the deal. Um, most folks are, but not everyone. But if you um, can use NEHA credit, there's an opportunity for that. Um, and then like today, we do webinars. Um, this is, I meant to change this to the one we just did last month. We did one in August on septic systems. Um, but for each one of these, we record them, we put them online. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, there's questions at the end of each one of these. And they're almost always different. At least some of them are different um, each time. And so there's a lot of useful information just from going through all the questions that people ask. You know, we only do this septic webinar once a year. Uh, usually it's in July and um, I had COVID in July this year, so we didn't do it till August. Um, but uh, we only do it once a year and there's a lot of good information in there. Um, we've also done targeted ones like um, we did this in 2016 and 2018 when, you know, lead was more uh, the hot topic, if you will. We had an expert, Dr. Kelsey Piper, who's at Northeastern, uh, talk about the work she did at Virginia Tech when she was there um, about lead in private wells. And, you know, Virginia, they have more of an issue because their water is more corrosive than their natural groundwater. And so there's a lot more lead issues than there are in Illinois anyway. But um, some of the work she's done, she presented that here. And it's not a research talk. It's meant to be for well owners. And there's a lot of good information. And so we've taken that information and linked to her paper and also have a lead page. It's just privatewellclass.org slash lead, where we list uh, a lot of sources of information. You know, the US EPA did a lot of work um, right after all the Flint stuff happened um, to look at water filters that would look, that take lead out. And so there's articles about that. Um, you know, some of those filters really work well. They reduce lead to nearly nothing from, you know, into the early, uh, over a thousand PPB. And so understanding those kind of resources, we've tried to make that available. Um, and then we have a series of training videos, if you will, that are all four to six minutes long about sp specific topics. Um, how does my pressure tank work? How, what is a ground, what is a sand and gravel well? You know, just on one thing, um, one of the bigger issues we find around the country is shared wells. There's a lot more of them than we realized. Um, you know, the definition of a public water supply is 15 homes or 25 people on an individual water system or well. Um, so there's a lot of places in the country where there might be three homes on a well or five homes on a well. And um, the only state that really regulates down to two homes on a well is still considered a special class of public water supply is Washington State that I'm aware of. And so for everybody else, if you have four homes sharing a well, um, you're still a private water supply. And there's issues that come along with that. Maybe that was originally put in with a father and three children when they built houses for the other three. So they all shared this well. Well, now that's been 40 years ago. The kids decide to sell. And now there's four different people living in those four different homes that aren't related, that aren't necessarily friends. And all of a sudden uh, they have issues with their well, um, you know, there tends to be a lot of problems um, with folks who share wells and uh, when a pump fails or there's not good water service or something like that. And so it's really a topic that's worthwhile to deal with. How does, well, why does my well keep losing pressure? Um, I think this video or one very much like it on how does my pressure tank work has over 400,000 views. I think it's 435 or something like that now. Um, which tells us a lot of people have pressure problems in their water systems. And it's a common thing. Um, not understanding what your pressure switch does or how to set that 
or how to change it, or if you're going to have an undersized uh, tank, um, you know, now we're going more to uh, the variable speed pumps and, and a pressure tank that's only for startup. It might be one or two gallons, um, but a lot of older homes especially still have the traditional sept uh, septic tank, pressure tank, excuse me. Um, and so understanding um, how that works is an important issue, especially if you have a two or three story home. Um, we started a podcast uh, last year, I think. Yeah, in uh, 2021, we've interviewed a lot of folks from diverse backgrounds. I just listed four here. Brian Swistock was an education coordinator, uh, private well coordinator at Penn State in Extension. Um, he's probably the most knowledgeable man I've ever met related to private wells, and it's a, it's a, a loss for all of us that he retired in December. Um, but, you know, he's tried a lot of things and been involved with a lot of things in Pennsylvania, which is the state that doesn't license drillers or have well construction code. And so their well owner education program was really robust and uh, really effective. Um, Dr. Wolf is with Boston Children's Hospital, and uh, he deals with problem situations with kids and a lot of times end up involving well water. And uh, Eric Yegi is with the Water Quality Association, which provides certification for treatment and also has a program for licensing treatment professionals. And uh, Dr. Gibson, uh, Jackie, is um, now with North Carolina State and has done a lot of work, work looking at environmental justice issues related to folks on private wells. And uh, she spoke at our conference this year um, in May, and uh, her presentation is about a small area around Raleigh, North Carolina, and it's really worthwhile to see the plight of some of these folks who um, everyone just ignored, um, and uh, they had water quality issues, uh, and uh, you know, getting folks to help private well owners sometimes is really a struggle. So if you're into that, uh, the podcast thing, uh, there's been 24, actually we just put out a 25th episode kind of as a special one. Uh, we on, interviewed um, Molly Willosen from NOAA, who is a, uh, puts out the drought monitor and uh, the issues related to private wells and drought. And um, that's all on this tap talk. Uh, it's just drinkingwaterpodcast.org. So overall, all of those things together, the goal of our program is really to target well owners and tell, explain to them and help them understand why their well is important, why they need to care how it works and what they can do to protect themselves from risk. So that's the private well owner side of things. But as far as environmental health professionals and others, we also have resources available for you in addition. So um, one of those is again, the NEHA class that's on their e-learning website. Um, we also are willing to host workshops with you or for you, as well as hook you up with the regional RCAP staff that could do in, excuse me, in-person workshops in your areas. Um, they've done a ton, um, well over, uh, 200 workshops around the country over the last six or eight years, uh, working with local partners uh, to either provide the space or help advertise, or you know, it's it's up to it's up to you really. Um, and then we developed this assessment tool I mentioned, and we've done well over 3,000 of those. Or RCAP has, uh, where they're working directly with the well owner one on one. And so um, we do put out a partners uh, we have a partners page and a partner newsletter. That newsletter goes out once a month. Um, if you want to get the newsletter, you can sign up on our under resource library. It says partner newsletter. We just need your information. You can look at all the past ones on the web page and see if you think they're worthwhile. We try not to put any fluff in there. They're all things that are useful. Um, if you scroll down that page, we have some additional resources. If you want to share the fact that we have a class, there's a thing you can download um, that you can hand out to people. And this brochure, um, the trifold, I'll show you that in a minute, but um, we developed that specifically to, for health departments to give out in their offices, and uh, I'll talk about that more when we get to it. So this is um, one of our newsletters. This is an older one. It's from 2017, but I highlighted because um, this homeowner lives in a Macomb, Illinois, which is a town of, um, I don't know, 15 or 20,000 people. They live four blocks from the town square. They've had public water there since 1916. And this person bought this house and realized that there was an old dug well in their backyard, uh, right next to the house. And it was actually causing a problem with the foundation. You can see how that concrete looks flat on this house side. Well, that was round. And the foundation's starting to push out because there was this open space. 
So um, we worked with uh, the local uh, with the local health department and the Western Illinois Department of Geology, um, and they have a groundwater protection and education committee, as well as um, that person is actually uh, from Gingrich Well Drilling. And uh, he's Mr. Gringrich was a driller in Iowa that does a lot of work in Illinois. He provided all the bentonite uh, to do this. And we made it a demonstration project. And we invited um, all the county health department people from like 13 counties nearby. And so we had a field day basically in this backyard of this home that's in uh, near downtown Macomb. And uh, we sealed a well. And so this is a video that's available uh, that we put together from that. And then, you know, as you go down the newsletter, there's information, there's new resources, anything that, you know, some state or extension might have put out that's a useful tool. Uh, and there's a lot of cool stuff being developed uh, these days, especially we're seeing a huge increase in the amount of work related to private wells and also research related to private wells. So uh, there's a, just a lot of good stuff available and we try to highlight it. Um, this is this month's newsletter. Um, I want to mention that Septic Smart Week is going to be 10 years old this year and uh, it's a huge program that uh, the Office of Wastewater Management um, orchestrates if you will. There's a whole group of uh, stakeholders, regional and national stakeholders who are involved and it's an opportunity um, for folks to highlight the importance of maintaining your septic system and all those things. And so um, I'll show a slide at the very end um, but the web page for the septic program at EPA is just epa.gov slash septic. And if you go there, there's a ton of resources available if you have people asking you about septic systems. Um, and we highlight that in our septic webinar, which again was last month. They're also doing a photo challenge this year. And as you as EHPs, any of you inspect uh, septic systems and have some cool pictures, I think you just have till tomorrow uh, to um, submit pictures for this photo challenge. And uh, yeah, there's information in our newsletter which you can get to on our website um, for that. Um, I mentioned the site assessment several times. It's really a tool that's meant to be um, used by someone who understands a lot about wells. And so it's got a site assessment, a well assessment, a geologic assessment, and then it's an opportunity to make recommendations. And what it really does is you're working with a well owner one-on-one -on -one and you're asking them questions, some they're not gonna know the answers to, but it's an opportunity then to raise awareness about what those things are. Like, you know, do you have backflow uh, devices on your spigots and things like that? And some people will look at you like a deer in headlights when you ask that question. And it's an opportunity to say, well, you know, if you're, especially if you're a farmer and you're using a hose and a tank to mix pesticides, you really need to have a backflow device on that spigot um, so that it can't get into your water system. Um, and also things like, you know, best management practices and vulnerable geologies, or even understanding their own well construction. And so this is about a six page form. There's 18 sections. Um, it's available on our website. Um, but it's really like if you're, if you're in a state where you do sanitary surveys for public water systems, then you're familiar with what a sanitary survey is. It's like a sanitary survey, but for a private well. There's no teeth to it. It doesn't have any legal binding in any way. It's really meant to be an educational tool to help a well owner understand their specific situation. And if you've worked a lot with well owners, you know as well as I do, um, almost every situation is a little different. The type of pipe they have, what they store near their well, um, you know, how they, uh, put a sanitary seal if they have one on their well, where their location is on the landscape, there's always something that's a little different. No two wells are the same. Maybe they hit it with a mower, you know, and you know, there's a big gash out of the side of a PVC pipe. We see all kinds of things, but it's an opportunity then to work directly with the well owner to promote best practices and encourage them to communicate. It's a chance to say, um, you know, you can talk to your local health department. They're not, they can't condemn your well. They just really want to make sure you're, you're being safe and you're protecting your family's health. And it gives you a chance then for them to ask questions and learn more about their well as well. So, um, and this says 2,800 total. I haven't updated this, but it's probably closer to 32 to 3,500 now. I haven't kept track, but the RCAP regions do so many of these a year. 
and um, we've developed a fillable PDF, and there's also a version on uh, iOS and Android for tablets, and, um, and there's a guide. So as I mentioned at the beginning, you really have to have some wherewithal related to private wells to even fill this out. It's not something that a homeowner can do themselves, but we created a guide that explains all the pieces. So like, you know, this shows the septic system. Section 10 is about the septic system. It's a conventional system. It's a thousand gallon tank. You know, it gives you a chance then to ask all those questions, but the guide actually lists a lot more material um, that gives you an idea of um, if, if you're not as familiar with some of those things. So it's, it's really useful. It's something we've had um, in the state of Massachusetts, there's a group that's doing, that's using the assessment on their own, uh, not related to our program. It's freely available. And they're working with well owners uh, for a project that's funded by the, uh, boy, the Health Foundation of Central Massachusetts, I think it is. And so um, we did develop it for this program, but we also developed it so that anyone who wanted to do uh, to work with well owners in their local area would be able to take this tool and use it. And, you know, we provide it back to the well owner filled out along with pictures and a well log if we can find it or whatever, you know. Um, but it's, uh, it's a good way to develop a relationship with some of the well owners in your area as well as um, help those that have a problem. And that's typically what happens. I know um, in Rhode Island, they have a very small health department and they've asked RCAP um, to help them whenever they get a call from a well owner with a really difficult situation. RCAP goes out and does a well assessment on behalf of the Rhode Island Department of Public Health and provides that to the well owner and then works with them even to sample their well if they need to and things like that. So um, if you're interested, um, it's on our webpage, but you can also contact me and I'd be glad to talk to you about it. Um, there's a well assess app I mentioned. There's, you know, there's an iOS and a Google version or Android version. Uh, there's also the downloadable PDF and that's where they're at. You scroll on a uh, resource library and this pop drop down will have the well assess app. And then there's an assessment guide, as I mentioned, and we include, you know, what you should say in your recommendations. Um, some of these are for every well owner, you know, sign up to take this class, sample every three to five years for inorganics and metals, why you should sample annually for coliform and nitrate, um, all those things. And even advice for the assessor uh, to take pictures so that you have a record, all those sorts of things. Um, now we do a training on this. Uh, our cap staff used to do these locally in person for our workshops and now we're doing them online and so um, if you're interested i don't know that we've scheduled one yet for um since we did one i think in january we'll probably do one near the end of the year or early next year but it's a four-hour workshop online that covers how to fill out the assessment tool we use three examples uh, actual field examples where i went out and and did these assessments as well as best practices for outreach, which gets into the stuff, the Barb Luconin stuff I showed earlier, and some of the results of the study we did that we were funded by CDC uh, to look at why well owners don't test. And so it's really pretty useful. Um, and again, it's all free if you're, um, and it's worth four hours of CE credit if you're a, a NIA uh, CE recipient. Um, we've had four conferences now, and uh, these, the first two were two and a half days. Um, we brought in uh, for the 2017 and 2019 conference, we had 26 speakers. Um, it's not a research conference. It's a practical conference. It was meant to be geared towards uh, EHPs and health departments to give them information that could, they could take back home and use. And so it's a lot of uh, a lot of practical advice and things that people have found in different areas or innovative ideas that folks have uh, done at a local level like getting a small grant to do something with a high school or things like that. And so um, we had Barb speak as our first speaker and our, our keynote kind of on that first conference about the work they did. And those are all $2 bills she's ironing there to put in those envelopes. Um, and it was a really great conference. Uh, we did it again in 2019. Um, and I mentioned Pennsylvania doesn't have well construction code. Todd Giddings is a local hydrologist who worked with um, a watershed group in Pennsylvania to create their own ordinance related to well drilling and well construction uh, to help create some of those rules that are missing. And so, um, 
and that was held in, uh, in Pennsylvania and Harrisburg. Then the last two, we did one in 2021, it was virtual, obviously, because of the pandemic. And um, our keynote there was Dr. Carolyn Murray, who's done a lot of work working with pediatricians uh, who work with families who have private wells. And then um, this year in May, we had one again virtually. And Dr. Gibson uh, spoke about the work she's done in Raleigh working with um, EJ issues and private well owners. And every one of those talks, even the ones that were in person, have been recorded. They're all on YouTube. Uh, you can basically see the entire conference. Uh, uh, we, they include a drillers panel each time where we brought in drillers from around the country uh, to talk about issues. We know that in some states, it's the local health folks who are regulating the drillers. And so there's some tension there. And so we put up uh, some pretty respectable drillers uh, for a panel each at each of these conferences to talk about issues and allow all the folks in the audience to ask questions. And uh, there really, there's a lot of good information in these uh, presentations if you're an EHP and you're working on private well issues. The brochure I mentioned, uh, this is a trifold. This is the front side, if you will, um, and it lists our information. And on the back side, it, you know, it's something you can hand out to a well owner. And it does, you know, the third step is, it will help you if you um, take this class, you'll learn more about your well and how it works and the things you should do for best practices. And we developed this with all the health departments in mind, but it's been used by a lot of different types of groups, extension, labs. Um, this yellow square here is, um, we left that blank on purpose so that you can put your own label there. Um, and so what we've done is we've, offered this through our newsletter and people can sign up to have, uh, well, I almost forgot, it's also available in Spanish, um, but we've offered it through our newsletter where people can sign up and we print it, We it's all trifolded and bundled in groups of 50 and we ship it to you all for free. And we've done this um, now five times. This is an older, this is from September 21, but um, I think we're up to 87,000 of these that we've printed and sent out to people. Um, and like Indiana's uh, health department, state health department, their lab requested 2,000 and they put one in every water sample result they send back to well owners in Indiana. And so, um, you know, the program has been pretty well vetted in that respect. Um, and uh, if you work with well owners, we'd be glad to send you some of these. We do have some left. Um, but yeah, we've, I don't know, we've sent these to probably 600 or 500 different organizations around the country and uh, sometimes as many as a thousand uh, each. So um, again, let us know. Um, we don't plan to do another printing until probably at least next summer. Um, just because the pandemic really changed how all this works. It was going like gangbusters. And then when the pandemic hit, all of a sudden, uh, no one needed any more of these because we, um, they aren't seeing people, so to speak. So uh, we're seeing that change a little bit now though. So as far as questions for today, um, well, I say this every time, but you know, we always get more questions than we can answer um, when we have so many people register, especially, I mean, there's 244 people on today, um, but we are gonna answer a number of questions. And if you ask a question that's really state specific, I probably won't answer it instead email me because we'll probably have to look it up. You know, I know someone asked about New York uh, in one of the questions, um, some of the jurisdictional issues there. Um, you know, we have a relationship with the New York Department of Health. I can ask them, but it's not something that, um, you know, is, it's not relevant to anyone who's not outside of New York or not in New York for one. And uh, so we try to deal with more general topics that are uh, questions that we can answer today. And then if you have a question, it looks like a few people um, have already asked questions. Katie's keeping track of those questions. So put them in, your, in the question box or the chat box. Uh, we share a Google Doc, which is really nice because we can both be in it at the same time. And when we get to the last slide where it says thank you and questions, um, I'll pull over that Google Doc and we'll go through the questions that you've asked today. Um, so don't go anywhere. And again, I'm looking at my other screen and it looks like there's been three questions already. Uh, and sometimes there's three and sometimes there's 20. 
and we'll answer them as long as you guys are willing to stick around. So um, I'm going to get to the questions. Um, first one, can this information be applied to very small public water systems supplied by groundwater? And it certainly can. Uh, in fact, after we started the private well class, um, EPA reached out to us and asked us to develop an online class for non-community public water systems. So it's on our, it's, we have a, another program that's very similar, but it's for small water and wastewater systems. It's called wateroperator.org. And on that website, there's a, a link to a class that's called Groundwater and Wells. And uh, we managed to get CEU credit for water and wastewater, or for water operators, I should say, in about 25 states. Some uh, just don't accept credit for things like that. But especially non-community systems, which, you know, like schools, restaurants, rest areas, campgrounds, a factory in the country, um, any other business that might have a well, um, they're very similar, right, to a private well. Sometimes they're, they're not, you know, a gas station may not use any more water than a private well uh, on a home would use. But they're considered a non, uh, they're either called, they're a non-community water system and so they're regulated, they're either transient or non-transient, not that that matters to most of the folks here, but um, everything about what they need to understand about their well is the same. Um, the only difference is, and it's a big difference, is that if they're a regulated public water supply, they have to follow the rules of the Safe Drinking Water Act, which requires them to sample. And every state has different rules, especially for non-community systems, a little bit different, some are more strict than others, um, but if they're a public water system, um, whether it's community or non-community, um, then sampling, you know, what I'm going to recommend that folks do that are on a private well today, and it's one of the questions down below, isn't relevant um, because they're required by the state to sample uh, every three months and there's a whole list of primary contaminants that have to be tested for and you know you need to talk to um, on the sampling side it doesn't apply um, because any public water supply has requirements for sampling to make sure that the water they're serving is safe for anyone that may go to that school or restaurant or rest area or campground um, hopefully that answers your question um, is pseudonymous testing in wells recommended? You know, um, not that we're aware of. And, you know, pseudonymous is a bacteria that does exist in water and soil, and it's fairly ubiquitous. Everything, I, I mean, I looked this up and started reading because we do some Legionella work, and I saw that as kind of a comparable thing. Um, you just don't see pseudonymous being a, a well issue per se. Um, it's not a common health issue in water. Uh, a lot of the stuff I found was about um, not washing fruits and vegetables, um, things like that. Um, what I did find, though, is that it's it really can grow fast in a situation like in a pipe. And so they contribute a lot to formation of biofilms. And what will happen in a biofilm um, is like the slime on the inside of a pipe is that other bacteria will latch onto that. So we see coliform, E. coli, Legionella, um, a lot of things when you have biofilm development. Um, you know, the difference between a public water supply, again, and a private well is every private, every public water supply, uh, every community water supply at least, has to add chlorine into their distribution system so that there's a chlorine residual through all their piping systems. So the last house at the farthest end away from the treatment plant still has a 0.1 residual of chlorine um, when they test, and that's to keep from biofilm formation from happening. No one uses chlorine in their uh, private well water system unless they have a common problem with E. coli or coliform that they can't get rid of. Um, you do see continuous chlorination, but not very often. Um, and, you know, it's way less than 1%. And so we realize, and everyone should realize, that many home systems probably have biofilms in their pipes um, just because there's so many common bacteria like pseudonomus um, that can form and create a biofilm and then that can harbor other things that might be bad if they're in the water. Um, but as far as pseudonomus being something you test for, you know, the reason you test for coliform as a first step 
is because it's really easy to test for and it's not something you should have in your well. And so if you do have coliform, it indicates that there's a pathway into your water system, your home water system, um, either from an unsafe well or some other uh, shallow source that's getting in the water. And that means you need to figure out what that is and uh, either, you know, put in a put on a sanitary well cap if you don't have one, or if you figure out that, you know, you have a shallow well and it's an issue um, because of septic or feedlot or whatever it might be, um, then maybe you need to consider continuous disinfection. Uh, whether that be chlorine or not is another matter, and I'll talk about that later because there's another question about it. But there's other ways to um, disinfect your water than just using chlorine. You can also use UV, uh, and there's some work now uh, on hydrogen peroxide is another oxidant that works for disinfection. Um, I have many people calling concerned about the smell of their water and the staining caused by their water on appliances. What can they test for to help identify the issue and what filters, water treatments do you recommend to help um, with this? So the staining is likely iron or manganese, you know, typically the red stain on your porcelain or in your sink or your, or your tub, um, or it could be manganese that's usually more of a black color. And the smell in most cases is going to be the rotten egg smell. And it's either caused by, if you have a bedrock well, there can be just sulfur in the bedrock that's causing that. Um, or a lot of times it's bacteria that generate hydrogen sulfide as a byproduct. Uh, sulfur reducing bacteria or sometimes even iron bacteria can um, participate in that. And so um, what I've done here for today is um, this is the list of things we recommend people sample for. And I want to point out that what we recommend is for a national audience locally there could be some other constituent that's natural in your water and i'll show you an example on the next slide um, which is why at the bottom it says get advice from your local or state health department i mean you know tazewell county illinois has arsenic in their aquifers and if you called the tazewell county health department and asked those folks what should i test for they're going to definitely tell you to sample for arsenic and that's just an example and that's actually on our list you know arsenic is a fairly common constituent in groundwater it's not everywhere um, I know we asked state regulatory agencies about uh, their arsenic situation in a survey. Um, this has probably been six or seven years ago. And there were seven states that said, we really don't have an arsenic issue in any of our public water supplies. Um, but most do. But what we recommend is annually test for coliform and nitrate. And again, you just test for coliform and nitrate because if you find coliform in your well water, or elevated nitrate, it means there's a pathway near the surface into your well or your water system, your well typically. Um, and it doesn't mean your well's necessarily safe, just testing for coliform and nitrate. And we have folks all the time who say, well, I, test my, I tested and it was safe. Would you test for coliform and nitrate? It doesn't mean your well's safe. You could have arsenic, you could have, um, you know, it could be that you have corrosive water and so you're leaching lead from your pipes. You need to sample for all these other things at least every three to five years um, to understand your general water chemistry and if you have issues. And things like manganese. Manganese is considered a secondary contaminant by the EPA right now because it's always been considered an issue like iron, staining, um, and all that stuff. Well, now there's research that shows that it causes neurological problems. And so it hasn't been regulated yet, but it's in the process of becoming a primary drinking water contaminant, which means it has health effects. And some states already regulate it. Health Canada already regulates it as a health adverse uh, constituent in water. And so it's important um, to test for these things, uh, just like if you have you know, copper, if you have copper piping, um, or if you have galvanized pipes, you know, zinc and cadmium can be in that as well as lead. And so this gives you a good general understanding of your water chemistry. And you should have someone who's qualified take a look at it. And if anything's elevated or it's above a health standard, then you should take that certainly to your health professional, um, if not your doctor. And uh, when I mentioned get advice from your local or state health department, the best example I have is Rhode Island. So this is on the Depart Rhode Island Department of Health's website, and all the little dots are where there used to be orchards that used arsenic as a pesticide through the 50s or 60s. Um, and so they identified all those because there's soil contamination for sure, 
um, and likely shallow groundwater contamination with arsenic. But the point is this big splotch in the middle, that's where there's elevated beryllium in their groundwater. When, until I saw this, you know, eight, 10 years ago, I had no idea beryllium was even regulated. But if you look on the Safe Drinking Water Act, it's a regulated contaminant by the US EPA and by all the states for community water supplies because it does have health effects. I would never recommend that everyone in the country sample for beryllium, but I'm hoping that all the county folks or the local health district folks in Rhode Island in this area understand that they have high beryllium. And that's you know why you'd wanna to go to your local source um, because that's an unusual thing. And that's all I can say, but it serves as a great example for us to say, you know, here's what you should test for in general, but you also need to ask and be inquisitive um, and find out if there's anything locally. You know, in the Northeast especially, there's a lot of times there's um, radium or radon um, uh, or uranium and arsenic. Uh, you know, Maine is, has a lot of arsenic, for instance. Um, we do in a few aquifers in Illinois, but in a lot of the state, there's not much arsenic. And it just depends. It's all based on the geology. It's all naturally occurring. Um, it's not a contaminant that you know, has been spilled. It's, you know, Arsenic's made up as part of one of the elements in the Earth's crust. That's the way it is. And so you need to understand those things. Um, as far as treatment, um, I'm not a treatment expert. I know enough to be dangerous, but Minnesota Department of Health has an excellent resource. And if you just Google home water treatment or MN home water treatment, you'll find this. And it, it's a great document. And I've, you know, I've shown on here on the uh, left side that how many pages this is it goes past page six but it lists every constituent what kind of treatment can be used and in this example I was looking at nitrate manganese and arsenic and I, I used this in a previous presentation um, but it goes through then which ones those use what they cost what they do uh, for instance aeration and filtration can take care of color taste and odor issues um, and I bring that up because that was one of the questions um, that led to this was about uh, the smell. Well, you can aerate, uh, which, you know, sometimes that involves adding a tank in, in front of your pressure tank that you vent off. Um, you let it, it, it'll come out of solution there. So uh, the best example I have of that is methane. You know, methane stays in solution in groundwater. Um, because it's under pressure. But whenever you bring it up to the surface and it reaches atmospheric pressure, all the methane comes off of it. So you see some wells, you actually, uh, you can even light a flame from their vent. Um, but some people have a tank where they put their water in this tank uh, so that it's at atmospheric pressure and all the methane bleeds off and goes out a vent tube that goes up, you know, above their uh, roof or whatever. And then they pump that into their pressure tank. And so there's a lot of methods to get rid of things like the smell. You know, also a carbon uh, cartridge filter will get rid of uh, some of that smell and things like that. This explains all of that. It's a really great resource. And, you know, there's no way um, I could explain this in the time we have uh, nearly as well and uh, understanding what the cost might be for a well owner as well as, you know, what things it will actually remove. You know, RO does a great job of removing a lot of things, but it's also can be really expensive. Uh, so um, as far as continuing with this, after testing for iron and manganese, you have a better idea of what needs to be done. So iron especially, it can be so high that you need specialized removal equipment. In other cases where it's less extreme, you can get, um, they have filters that oxidize the iron first so you can get the iron out because it, it'll participate. Uh, precipitate into iron oxide um, or even softeners that are meant to remove iron or optimize for removal of iron and and that'll pull manganese and actually we've seen softeners that even though they're not rated to do so will also remove some arsenic just because it's the same process uh, that you're using for the other metals and so as far as the smell I've mentioned already um, carbon filters but if it's uh, if it's because of the bacteria two problems. One, you can shock chlorinate to kill the bacteria. Sometimes it'll take two or three times to actually do that. Um, and unfortunately, because they're so common in groundwater, those bacteria, they will come back. And so that's one of the times we'd recommend using continuous chlorination. Um, 
it might be necessary in order to keep that smell away. And the other option I mentioned already is a second tank where you can vent the gas prior to pressure tank, similar to gas in for methane. Um, yeah, so that's, uh, so more on chlorine, because I, you know, this was another question we got was, it was suggested to me that I install a chlorinator at my water source or pump, so I did. Uh, I don't like it, and that's probably because of the taste. Oh yeah, that's what it says here. And question whether it was really necessary, I don't want the taste chlorinated water, and I already used a water purifier connected to a, my faucet. Uh, shouldn't that be enough? Well, understanding why you were suggested to add chlorination is really important to understand. Um, so chlorine is a disinfectant, but it's also an oxidant. So, um, so for instance, communities will put a chlorinator at their well before it goes into their treatment plant so that there's contact time and it can oxidize things like iron or arsenic and help remove those. So it turns out arsenic co-precipitates with iron. And so we see a lot of, a lot of small public water supplies or community water supplies who in their iron removal are also removing arsenic. And it's a way to optimize that. Um, that's not likely for a private well situation, but it really, it does matter why you have a chlorinator. And if it's just because someone suggested it and you haven't you know, tested your water, you don't know all that, then, then we don't know if it'd be necessary or not. It really depends. Um, and as I mentioned before, we'd only recommend continuous disinfection if your well was connected to a source so, you know, if you have a shallow, older well and you keep having bacteria hits and no matter how many times you shock chlorinate it, you still get bacteria in your well. That means your well isn't safe and isn't properly sealed. You really have two choices. You can add disinfection and keep using your well, or you can put in another well and properly uh, seal it or go into a different unit that's deeper. Uh, it's very possible that there's a sh it's a shallow issue with the water table going towards your well from your septic uh, field and you're just you don't have it's just gonna it's just gonna be a problem so um as far as continuous disinfection if it's because of bacteria you could use uv as an alternative ultraviolet light um you know that's fairly prominent in areas like tennessee and kentucky and southern illinois and indiana where there's a lot of springs that are in use because those are always going to be contaminated with bacteria. And so folks that want that spring water and not the bacteria will use a UV unit uh, to kill all that. And, um, and then you don't have the chlorine taste. And so we see that's, a, that's actually a fairly popular option these days. Um, and as far as your purifier, um, you know, there's a lot of terms, but I, it really depends on what your water purifier does. Is it a carbon filter? Does it, is it from, has it been tested by a third party where it lists all the contaminants that it removes? Um, we'd need to know more specifics about that and whether that's enough or not. It may not, it may just be a five micron filter and that um, isn't necessarily gonna stop a lot of things that uh, might be a contaminant. So as an example, um, Someone asked how do wells get contaminated by local septic systems, and it really fits in with the last question because this is from the US EPA septic uh, webpage. And this diagram shows how your septic could contaminate your drinking water well. But all of this hinges on how deep the water table is, how fast water can move through the water table, where your well is getting its water from, is it a shallow well and it's coming from the water table or is, is it a deep well that's 200 feet deep and there's a clay layer between uh, where your well is getting its water and where the drain field you know, is, is putting into the local uh, shallow geology, all of that matters uh, to say whether or not it's gonna be contaminated. What we typically see is if your septic system is contributing to your drinking water well, it's because there's either a thin sand seam that runs between the two. And so everything else is maybe clay or till, um, or there's a bedrock fracture. You're in an area where it's bedrock near the surface and your drain field's basically putting water right into one of those fractures. And so it's using, again, I mentioned pipe flow and it's getting right to your well. There's a reason, um, you know, and, and setbacks that states have like saying, 
you need a 75 or 100 foot setback between your well and a septic field are meant for general conditions. Um, if you have a more risky situation, like it's karst or you have bedrock at the surface, then some states actually have rules that say it has to be farther. And that, again, may not help. It really depends on those things I've listed here, where your well's at, how it was constructed, how deep it is, what the local geology is that really dictates you know, where those things are going to go. And this shows, this example shows flow from left to right in the natural groundwater flow. If it's the other way, you have no issue, right? And so, um, and that's not an easy thing to determine uh, what the shallow water table flow direction is, other than um, typically the water table um, flows toward an outlet, like a stream or a creek or um, a low spot. And so it's usually flowing from higher ground to lower ground. And so like in this example of this home, if the septic system is at a higher elevation, the land isn't flat, uh, then likely the water flow is under the house. Um, but it's, you know, the problem with all this is many times it's a local situation that you have to really look at on an individual scale, which is why I said earlier, every well is different because the situation is usually very different every time. Um, yeah, that's my best answer for that question. Um, are EHPs required to test new private water wells after installation? Well, it really depends on where you live, and I'm just gonna give two examples. So in some states, yes, other states, no. Um, Tennessee, I think they try to sample one in five wells that are installed, just because of manpower and, and the funding they have. You know, some states, again, have better resources and than others or uh, whatever. So in Illinois, we're five times the size of Massachusetts, Illinois is. We have county health departments that all answer to our state health department. Um, we used to have 102 county health departments, but now we have 86. I think that's right. And so some of those are two or three counties together have one health department because they have smaller populations, smaller, you know, footprint or whatever. Um, we sample every well, or every well has to be sampled when it's installed, and that information has to go to the county health department. They come out, go out and inspect wells when they're being installed, um, and that's it. Once that's done, they're done. So Massachusetts, which is one-fifth the size of Illinois, has over 350 local health districts. In Massachusetts, the counties have no jurisdiction. Every local health district can set its own rules. So you have health districts that may require testing at property transfer. Um, there's a few that may have the ability to condemn a well, and you have others that have no rules whatsoever. And again, I mentioned this earlier, you could cross the street, and on one side of the street, you have all these rules related to your well, and on the other side of the street, because it's at the, at the boundary of two local health districts, you may have no rules. Uh, there's no sampling, there's no anything. And you know that's really uh, my problem with that is it really should be equal health protection under the law, and um, and that shouldn't be down to such a local scale. Um, to me, it's better if at least as a state. I mean, whether there should be federal rules, um, I'm not sure how that would be managed because it's always been state jurisdiction or local jurisdiction uh, in the case of some of the eastern states. So um, whether or not their test uh, tested or not is totally dependent on where you live. That's the bottom line. You need to ask um, at the local level and find out what the rules are. And um, and and even states, you know, that require well logs, we find that sometimes they don't have the personnel um, or it's not the priority. And so there's drillers who don't turn in logs and they don't do a lot about it. And so when we go to do work in one of those states and start looking for well logs. We don't have any of them in an area. You know, I was trying to do a study on arsenic where there's a state um, that I won't name um, where we know there's a lot of arsenic. And I did a lot of arsenic research in the early 2000s. And I went door to door to a bunch of houses and they gave me the name of two different drillers. I went to the state. They didn't have hardly any of the logs. So I went to both drillers and each driller blamed the other one. And each one said, I turn in my logs, and but this other guy doesn't. And the other one said the same thing. 
And in the end, we just didn't do the work there because we didn't have the information we needed to understand what we were going to find in our water quality samples. And so it's really hit or miss. There's a lot of reasons why things happen, especially when you get down to the local level. It's probably not the best way to manage things. It'd be better if it was at least at a state level. Um, but, you know, I don't make those decisions. And so that's kind of um, the best answer I got is you've got to ask. Uh, it depends on where you're at. How crucial is grouting uh, on a well? Well, it's very critical. Um, so, you know, if you're not familiar with grout, grout is the um, clay or cement type material that goes. So when you drill a well, let's say you're going to put in a five inch well, you may drill a six and five eighths or a seven and seven eighths hole to put that well in. <clears throat> so the annulus is the area outside of the casing that is still open because of the borehole being larger. So you fill that with grout, which is a lot of times a cement or a very fine clay that won't, when it hardens or gets in the formation, won't let water through. And the idea, <coughs> excuse me, the idea is you want to prevent anything from the surface to be able to go along down the outside of the casing and eventually get in the well. And that's why there's rules uh, for uh, in putting grout in. Anyone that has well construction code also has, a, has rules for the type of grout, how you have to put it in, how to ensure it's in place and all that stuff. Um, I wanna mention Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services did this grout study in the early 2000s and they found that even following the rules in certain types of geology, well, I got something in my throat, I apologize. <clears throat> um, liquid grout sometimes won't stay in place. And so um, actually when that study came out, it was all over in the drilling magazines and everything else. Um, some people expected a lot of states to change their well construction code. Well, no one did. And so um, my point there is that there are probably wells out there that even though they were constructed to code, in quotes, um, if they're in a certain type of geology, some of that grout may have left uh, the borehole and there may be a pathway. And so it's not something that you can always be sure that a uh, properly grouted well actually can't, couldn't, that can't be the source of the contamination if you find it in a well. And I encourage you, especially if you work with well owners a lot, um, we had DHS come to our first conference. Which I thought it was an important issue to bring up. Um, you can look at that presentation um, on our YouTube channel under the 2017 conference, or you can Google Nebraska Grout Study, and you'll find a lot of information about um, all those things. But as far as it being crucial, you know, certainly. Um, what they determined is that rather than using liquid grout, the safest thing to use were natural bentonite chips. Um, because when those absorb water and expand, it's the best seal. And uh, the problem is it's not the easiest thing to use. And so, you know, well drillers would rather use a trimmy pipe and use liquid drought. Um, and that's, you know, acceptable. Um, it's just in some cases, if it's uh, too thin, it'll just go out in the formation and not stay in the borehole. Uh, I have people calling concerned about developments uh, nearby that are scared. The private wells will dry up from the developments. Can you talk about this and on why or how this happens? Well, certainly it's a, a legitimate concern because um, it depends on how much aquifer there is, how extensive it is, how much water is available. You know, the more straws you put in, um, that can also take a uh, head off the aquifer, if you will. So the water levels will start lowering just because of atmospheric pressure. Um, put too many straws in there, so to speak, it doesn't uh, hold up. Um, but also, you know, like what we saw in California since 2012 is um, because of the drought and the lack of recharge to aquifers, there just there's too much water use. And so um, a lot of private wells now that were three or 400 feet deep are dry and they're drilling wells six or 700 feet deep to get water. And um, it's really based on local conditions. And I know I say that a lot, but it really is. Um, we have areas in Illinois and Sangamon and Fulton counties where there are no aquifers and they're all using large diameter dug or bored wells. 
and every summer that's dry, the water table lowers enough that their wells won't um, hold water, or you know, there's no the water tables below the well, and so uh, and the problem there is there's only so much uh, unconsolidated or um, of material above bedrock, and once you hit rock, there's no water there either, and so um, they haul water every summer, and it's just uh, there's no solution other than being put on a public water supply for some of those folks because there just is not a water supply available. And so, uh, you know, understanding from a geologist or a hydrogeologist point of view, um, what kind of aquifer might be there in the area you're talking about, um, what the anticipated yield of an aquifer might be, those are all important questions that will either ease people's mind or make them worry more, but it's certainly, um, you know, it's it's every every piece of land isn't created equal. There's not water everywhere that's potable and um, accessible. You know, in some cases there's water available that's salt water. Um, we have an area in Illinois where um, everybody's on um, water from a large lake in I think 11 counties because the only water in the ground is bedrock that was uh, an ancient inland sea, and it's just like the ocean and salt water. And so you really have to treat the heck out of it to drink it. Um, and so it's just, that's, you know, it's not equal and fair uh, everywhere. Um, climate change, what will, what will result, what impact will happen from the loss of groundwater from climate condition changes? Well, we're already seeing that, you know, especially over the last four or five years, uh, the drought in California has depleted the aquifers um, but it also, when those water levels lower past where they've ever been, I mentioned the brown clay and the gray clay. So there's, in rock, there's a lot of metals. And whenever it hits, whenever that has access to air, it causes chemical reactions, it oxidizes, and we see releases of metal. Um, and so you can have, it can change the chemistry, it can release metal into the groundwater, and it also increases the cost, like um, I think, Someone asked a question about what it costs for a well. Well, we're looking at $50,000 for a well in California today. Um, in other states, it's cheaper. You know, and um, we just had a colleague here who had to drill a new well, and I think it cost him $11,000. Um, so it really depends on how deep you have to go, all those things. But um, we're seeing more dramatic changes, not only on the drought side, but also more rainfall events and, and stronger hurricanes affecting areas. You know, there's been uh, literally thousands of wells in the last three or four years in Texas, Louisiana, and Florida that have been inundated by flooding. Um, that causes bacteria problems. They have to be chlorinated. Um, and then where that really becomes a problem is for those that can't afford sampling or remediation. Um, some of those folks just choose to keep drinking the water anyway and get sick. And uh, it's, uh, you know, there's not enough to go around per se um, or enough advocates for those folks um, out there uh, when they're on a private well because there's no regulatory teeth to anything to support them like there would be for a community water supply. Um, my well is a shallow well which has elevated coliform. My water is part of a watershed that supplies water to Baltimore City and Baltimore County. I think that's supposed to say um, it should not have water quality issues. I disagree. You don't know. There's not, no relation there. Um, I've gotten no help from local water people. They don't even know, they don't even follow their own procedures for chlorination treatments. What can I do to solve the problem? So, you know, again, it's a very local issue. And I guarantee you, they chlorinate for Baltimore City and Baltimore County. And their public water supply, um, they have to. Um, the fact that you have elevated coliform suggests that your well isn't properly constructed or you have a shallow source, which is what I've been saying today. Um, and so you need to um, shot chlorinate your well the right way is the bottom line. And, um, and then see if it comes back. And if it does, then there's a, probably a shallow source that's getting into your well that you then would have to decide whether you wanna put in a new well or find what the source is and eliminate it or add continuous disinfection. And that's really your options. And as far as shock chlorination, um, we recommend using this document. It's from the Minnesota Department of Health. And actually, they've revised this, and we still offer the old one. 
because it's better than the new one. Um, they trimmed it down to try to make it less pages. But if you go to our web page under resource library, I showed earlier that you know, for each lesson there's a bunch of resources. Under lesson 10, you can find this document and download it. And it's really cool. It, it talks about how to mix it at the right amount. I mentioned chlorines and oxidant. So if you mix it too, if you have it too high of a concentration, it can leach metals from your pump or your pipes. Um, so you mix it at the right concentration. You follow all the procedures in here and it even tells you what to do with your treatment equipment. And um, it's how you should disinfect your well. And if you follow that, uh, you should be able to do it yourself. If you're not comfortable with that, then you should find a contractor to do it for you. But tell them you want to follow this procedure and have them do it that way. Um, yeah. Is information about my well registered somewhere? Our builder didn't give it to us. So you need to contact your state well folks. If you Google my state well water logs, you're going to find uh, who has logs for your state. In Missouri, that's DNR. In Wisconsin, that's DNR. In Illinois, it's the Water Survey or Geological Survey. Um, and you know, some states don't have all that information or they have partial information. Mississippi doesn't require you to file a log if I think it's uh, less than five inches in diameter for a pipe. And so you see a lot of wells that get installed that are four inch wells in Mississippi. because then the drillers don't have to deal with anything with the state. So, um, but that all said, if you're putting in a well, or you're, someone's asking you for advice about putting in a well, require that a log be part of the drilling contract and make sure you know the state's rules um, or the, your local rules if you have them so that they're meeting code when they put in the well. But like those logs I showed earlier, that's amazing information for you to have or for a well owner to have. Um, and so require it. You know, we've seen people who are like, my driller says they don't have to give me the log. I mean, there's a lot of competition among drillers in some places and that information they consider proprietary and try to protect it. Um, but you need to do what you can uh, and make sure that you have the information uh, for your well and you're not relying on somebody else. And then, you know, I would recommend to anyone who has any of those questions uh, to take our class. Because one of the things we talk about is what is a good driller and what's not a good driller and what things should they have, you know, be bonded and, um, you know, the advice they give you, and you should be able to answer questions until you're satisfied, excuse me, and all that sort of stuff. Um, yeah. So that's the last thing I have. We do have some questions, so I'm going to pull that over in a second. I want to mention that uh, the Septic Smart program that EPA has next week is Septic Smart Week. It happens every second or third week in, in September each year. This is the 10th year. Um, I encourage you to take a look at their page. If you um, are with a health department, um, you know, put a link up on the website uh, for your website. Make sure people know about it. If you're doing social media, throw out some of the stuff or find us on social media and, you know, retweet or resend the stuff that we put out um, about Septic Smart Week. Um, it's really a great program to make people aware and, you know, one, the one thing I'll say about septic systems is we do the, when we do the septic webinar, you know, people can ask questions in advance. I bet 20 people every time, every year, ask me, how do I find my septic tank? No one should have to ask that question. They should already know where their septic tank is. They should know when it was pumped last, um, all that stuff. And there's a lot of work to do to educate folks on septic systems which one in every five homes is on a septic system in this country um, about what they need to understand, um, not only for the just the septic side, um, but also its effect on groundwater and private wells. So um, with that, hang on, I'm going to move over. Uh, this real quick. Can I'm assuming everybody can see that okay. So the first question, what were the other main issues affecting private wells? Um, you know, the slide deck's available at the end. You can request it. And also, um, this is all being recorded. So you can go back and watch it once. Uh, Katie won't get it online until sometime next week. But um, yeah, it's, it's all there. I just ask that you come back and take a look. Um, would ground penetrating radar be something good to use for detecting wells? Um, 
I would think it probably would be, but I don't know. You know, most folks don't have access to something like that, um, and it'd have to be done at the right scale. Um, you know, they're using some of that now for doing geophysics with wild or with understanding where aquifers are and all that stuff. But on a scale of detecting a well, um, I'm not sure. I don't. I'm not a geologist, and I don't know enough about that to know if it can really get down to that. You know, if it's a four-inch well casing, that'd be pretty detailed piece of information for it to find. So um, I think I did go over sampling for the third question, um, but also I probably go over that in more detail in uh, some of our other webinars. And so I encourage you rather than, you know, it's really, I show a couple examples of other states that might have GIS applications online where you can zoom into an area or look at what the water quality is in a given county. They've all made it public. And so there's, it depends on where you live again, what's available. But um, as far as um, we do have a webinar that goes over best practices about sampling, when to sample, where to sample, why, shows examples of why you want to collect a groundwater sample and a drinking water sample, um, all that stuff. So I encourage you to go look at that or email me and I'll send you the right uh, webinar to take a look at. Um, how can I find out if I have a shared well and what type of well? I only have two neighbors. Well, um, I would say that everyone that has a well, you should be able to see it if it's in your front yard, backyard, or whatever. And um, you should be able to see if your neighbors have their own well or maybe ask them. Um, it's very unlikely you have a shared well and don't know it, um, although it's certainly possible. Um, but, you know, your well is a physical thing that you should, you know, it's either got, you know, some people decorated, put rocks or even a fake rock or do whatever. Um, as far as what type of well, that's why you need to log. And um, again, if you Google uh, your state's well logs, you'll find out an, if there's an agency that actually has those. And it doesn't mean that you will have your log per se, um, but if, like if you're in, yeah, um, you can also email me and we can look into it more. It depends on what state you're in. Um, we can find you somebody locally who can uh, help you with that because, you know, you really just have to do some research looking to see if there's logs available, what the geology is nearby. Um, you know, you're likely to have the same type of well as your neighbors if you have, if they have wells. And so even if even one of those logs showed up, it's uh, usually more than likely that um, they're similar, at least in depth and stuff. So um, can hard water cause skin conditions? Um, you know, I'm, I don't know. I'm not a health person or a uh, skin person. I haven't really heard of that. Um, I know it's an issue with, you know, soap and all those other things. But, um, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm not 100% sure, so I don't have an answer. Um, what is a good way to find labs that can test for a variety of contaminants, especially those that don't fall under coliform and nitrates? So the best source um, would be to use a lab that's certified by the, your state. So every state certifies labs that can do compliance sampling, which means a public water supply can take their samples there uh, for their compliance testing. You know, that has to be done every three months or whatever. And so every state um, has a list of those on their website. And the way to find that is uh, through the US EPA's website. If you um, Google US EPA compliance sampling or, um, you know, I can find it for you. I just can't do it this minute. Um, if you'll email me, I'll send you the link. But um, I, I can see the page in my head. There's a map of the US and you click on the state and it takes you to the state primacy agencies page, which in Illinois is Illinois EPA, which you know in, in Wisconsin is Wisconsin DNR, and they have a list of labs that they've certified for either bacterial testing, chemical testing, or both, and um, you wanna find one of those. And they may be in any state. You know, uh, These days, uh, with shipping the way it is, you have labs that are certified um, in New Jersey to do sampling for Illinois because they went through the process with our state primacy agency and they just ship samples um, and ship them back and with overnight and all that. So 
Um, but there should be a list of labs. You can also call your privacy agency and just say that I'm looking for a certified lab to do a private well analysis um, and they should be able to help you. Um, yeah. Where can sanitarians find accessible geologic data so local health departments know what contaminants are present in their jurisdiction? Well, it would be calling those groups I mentioned, um, your state geological survey, your state water resources agency, um, you know, uh, your USGS office, um, all the folks, you know, we map aquifers too. And so um, depending on what your question is, I know who to send you to as far as finding the right information. Um, and like us with our state geological survey, um, they, our state geological survey has an interactive GIS application where you can see every water well in the state, which is really nice. We use it too. Um, but then if you want the paper record or a copy of it, you need to come to us because we store all of them and, um, or, and have them all scanned. And so as, fine, as far as finding water quality information, um, you know, again, in Illinois, we have a public service lab that does sampling and we have over 30,000 private water well samples. So we have a pretty good idea of what the, uh, what the constituents are in, in the state. Um, but there's other groups that may have some of that information too, like our state EPA office, um, which is a primacy agency because they sample, you know, even though a community water supply has compliance sampling of their drinking water, which is their finished water, I know our primacy agency, and I imagine a lot of others, also sample the wells that are part of a community water supply so they know what the groundwater quality is, and they would have that information. Um, but as far as accessible geologic data, um, I would Google your well logs again because those have the geologic logs on them, and any wells in your jurisdiction, whether it's a county or smaller, um, you know, you should be able to look at all the well logs then and get an idea of where there's sand at 20 feet in some areas and there's bedrock at 20 feet in other areas or whatever it might be. Okay. And we can help you with that if uh, you let us know where you're at. In Minnesota, it's recommended to test for lead, arsenic, and manganese at least once by the Minnesota Department of Health. Could you tell me where the recommendation of testing every three to five years comes from? Um, it comes from, from our point of view, we do a lot of sampling. Um, both of groundwater for projects looking at source water issues and drinking water. And um, you can see changes in some constituents. And so, or there's changes because of things like lowering water levels, change the chemistry, or even we found um, there was a small earthquake in Missouri and some of our wells in Southern Illinois, the water levels changed by four to six feet. Um, and that's because of the way the rocks changed and fractures were connected and all that stuff, that also can change the chemistry. Um, you know, some constituents like arsenic, if it's in a deeper aquifer, we typically don't see a wide range of changes, but other things there can be. And if there's been a change in a well because of um, the well's been hit by a mower or something else has happened, the cap no longer the, you know, the, the gasket that's on a sanitary sealed well cap has gone bad. Um, you know, there could be changes in the chemistry. Um, there's just a lot of reasons why it's good to test every so often just for the peace of mind that it's not changed. Um, because especially for deeper groundwater, the chemistry should be fairly consistent. And if for some reason it's different, uh, it's got a different, you know, just like we tell folks you should test Anytime there's a change in taste, odor, smell, something that's not what it was, then you should try to figure out why. Um, it's just good to have that information. And that's, that's what we recommend. And that's, uh, then that's just from our experience. Um, I've heard that manganese and arsenic concentrations can be impacted by pH changes in the water. Do you think that climate change and changes in weather as, as a, a, acidified rainfall will increase the prevalence of arsenic and manganese. Um, you know, I, that's a difficult question because I don't know that, um, I would say one, especially deeper aquifers are much more resistant to impacts from climate change. You know, going back to the Muhammad Aquifer, which I've uh, worked in, in a long time, for a long time, um, what we see there with arsenic is it's mediated by the chemistry and how reducing the conditions are. So, um, when we still see sulfate in the groundwater, 
Um, there's sulfate reducing bacteria that are in the aquifer. Um, the arsenic stays bound to the um, particles in, you know, that make up the aquifer. As soon as there's no sulfate left, a different type of bacteria take over, methanogenic bacteria, and we see arsenic being released. So we have, and, and that's on a local scale. So we've sampled wells that are less than, you know, 200 yards apart, and we've seen over a uh, order of magnitude difference in arsenic levels. And you can draw a graph of sulfate versus arsenic, and it's, you know, it's a line that as soon as you lose the sulfate, all of a sudden the arsenic goes way up. And, and that's in a particular aquifer. Um, and so it's, you know, there's a lot of complications to all that. And um, I don't know about acidified rainfall. Um, I would say that, you know, that's much less of an issue than it was in the 80s, right? Um, and, you know, for 38 years, we had the uh, NADP, National Atmospheric Deposition Program, that looked at acid rain. Uh, now that's at Wisconsin, but it was here at the Water Survey until a couple years ago. And I don't know that, um, yeah, I'm not sure. That's a big scale question, I guess is the best way to say it. So, um, yeah, I don't know that I would say that it's going to increase the prevalence. I mean, it's either there or it's not there. It's a matter of the chemistry. And, and I guess you're asking if the chemistry is going to change. Um, I think it's going to be much more gradual to change than, say, things like water levels dropping 200 feet and all of a sudden all that rock is exposed to air. That's going to be a more dramatic effect, especially if it increases again and uh, gets into the aquifer and that sort of stuff. Um, do you have any good PFAS resources or studies to help at, ask civilian questions about, on their groundwater? Um, you know, we haven't put together any PFAS resources yet. Um, there's certainly a lot out there, and there's a lot of testing and other things going on. Um, and I guess my answer is no. We don't have anything uh, ready to give. But I think if you look online, you'll find information. You know, um, even the Water Systems Council put out some stuff about, you know, PFAS is treatable. Um, you know, there's methods out there that will uh, remove it from water. Uh, and so um, it shouldn't, uh, you know, the, the real problem with PFAS is it's so prevalent not only in groundwater or drinking water, but in our bodies, on our clothes, uh, in our in the air, it's, uh, we're still learning um, just how ubiquitous it is in the world. And so, um, yeah, I think there's still a lot to be done with PFAS as far as, you know, some of the different PFAS chemicals, they haven't even developed methods yet for uh, identifying them at the levels they need to and it you know, just it's uh, I think we'll be studying it in 20 years like we are today um, I mean we'll be a lot further down the road but it, um, I think along the way the guidance is going to change based on new information and we have not tried to put anything together for that so uh, luckily there's a lot of really smart people working on um, a lot of pieces of the PFAS issue so that's the best I can offer um, yeah, well, hey, it's way past time. I appreciate everyone who stayed, and um, we're, um, I guess we'll call it a day. Thank you.